All right, well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Uh, pretty, pretty motivated down here in, in the front. Uh, I don't, know, I don't know where Kevin Heineman went. He was way in the back. And uh, where are you at, Kevin? All right, all right. Motivated this morning. Good to go. Well, thanks for joining us again. I, I think uh, part of the problem this morning is people had too good a time at the, at the Rocket City Bash last night, uh, which was a great event put on by the local chapter, and uh, hope you got to enjoy that. We're finishing strong with uh, tremendous uh, fireside chat this morning. Uh, just in a few minutes, you'll see uh, General uh, Gary Brito uh, talking about the Army profession. That's going to be a great one. And then we have a panel, a really good panel, on synchronizing uh, modernization to realize future capabilities. Uh, that, that'll be a tremendous panel. And, and we'll close out the day uh, with uh, AMC, uh, Lieutenant General Chris uh, Mohan, uh, with a, a keynote. And uh, it, it'll be a great one, a great way to, uh, to finish off uh, what has been uh, a fantastic few days here. Just uh, great to see. So let's get started without further ado. Uh, Brian, let's see, are you going to come introduce? All right, introduce the panel, and then we'll get started. Hey, Joe. Hey, good morning, teammates. Uh, I'm Colonel Retired Brian Cook, and amongst other things, I'm the VP of Programs at the great Texas Capital Area chapter in Austin, Texas. I'm also a DOD growth executive at a small, better-owned business in Austin, Texas called MKS2 Technologies. We're excited to have this opportunity to hear from and engage General Gary Brito, an old friend and mentor of mine, the TRADOC commander, about strengthening the Army profession. Leading today's fireside chat is AUSA's own General Leslie Smith. I trust most of you have heard General Smith's bio before, but he is the Vice President of Leadership and Education at AUSA. And after his graduation from Georgia Southern, he was commissioned as a Chemical Corps officer. General Smith's a seasoned leader with more than 35 years of service and commanded up through battalion, the Suburning School, and the Mission Support Center of Excellence. He finished his awesome Army career as the 66th Inspector General of the Army. So at that point, uh, I'll like to hand over the reins to General Smith to what's bound to be an insightful fireside chat. Thanks, Brian. Yes, sir. Let's give him a round of applause. All right. A lot of pressure up there. I, I love doing these uh, fireside chats because uh, I get a chance to harass my good friend here. Can you turn my mic down a little bit, please? I have a, somewhat of a booming voice. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like General Brown. You walk in the hallway, hey, what's going on? So today I have General Brito, who's, who's a, a lifelong friend. Uh, he's led at every level in our Army, uh, and we've met so many years ago. Uh, but as a, as a general officer, Joint Readiness Training Center, uh, the ma uh, Maneuver Center of Excellence, then he, he um, I don't know if he messed up or if he moved up, became the Army G1, and now the Training and Doctrine Command Commanding General. So today we're going to talk about strengthening the Army profession, which is a topic that we really, uh, we both think a lot about uh, in our organization. So, so General Brito, Gary, um, what I'd like to do is, is get some, some feedback from you on the, the Chief's four priorities and, and then the one specifically mm -hmm. that Training and Doctrine Command has been given the, the primacy on, the responsibility on. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, well, one, thank you, Les, and thank you, Brian, as well, for the opening remarks and to the audience. Thanks for the opportunity to spend some time with you today. I won't be, repeat the, the four focus areas that the Chief has gone, and it clearly connects to the theme of today sure. and this conference. But the Army profession or strengthening the Army profession, I think deliberately underpins all of them. Okay. And if you look at it, the, the first layer of bricks and warfighting readiness is our soldiers, our leaders, our civilian professionals. Anything we do to make the Army profession remain strong will make all those other focus areas work. Pardon my hand and arm signal. Sure, that's kind of fine. talk that way. Uh, and it is what TRADOC has been doing with and for our Army for 50 years. This happens to be our, our anniversary. That's right. In July of 23. Now, despite the anniversary, uh, any effort, intellectually, fiscally, you name it, and strengthening the Army profession is, is necessary to ensure success in those other four focus areas. No different than it was 10 years ago, five years ago, you name it. And if I may continue, continue less, uh, it's also probably more important now as our Army is transitioning from 15, 20 years of focus on COIN, GWAT mm -hmm. type uh, stuff, 
and then supporting the continued transformation, which is ongoing, uh, making sure our army is ready, and I say our army, big army, all three components for what could be large-scale operations and supporting this multi-domain operations battlefield. That's critical. And not to get geeky or bumper sticky on, on us, but challenging the command to include myself and take zero compromise on warfighting capabilities at the respective echelon and respective MOS. Okay. Mastering the basics. And I'll steal the, Sergeant Major, the current Sergeant Major of the Army's quote in being really brilliant at the basics. Right. Now, it could sound somewhat simple, but you know, the private coming in, he or she, when they leave their AIT, respective AIT, they got it. They're ready for it. So training lethal warfighting ready soldiers and all several components of that and delivering competent thinking leaders. If, if those two things happen at a minimum, it feeds in well uh, to strengthening the Army profession. I could go on on that, but uh, it, that's critical. And clearly a nexus tied to the theme of today's of this conference this week and supporting the, the modernization of our Army. Right. And you can't take the people aspect out of it. Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a human in the loop with everything. That's right. At every echelon and realize there's some speeding up that needs to take place with that as well, which yeah. could impact the way we teach, the way we develop doctrine, uh, doctrinal training, leader development, leader education, uh, training soldiers, leader education is critical. Okay. So talk a little bit more about how TRADOC is gonna do the other parts of the dot mil PF mm -hmm. uh, in support of every, all the new systems that the Army is coming out with. Sure, I do think there's, there's gonna be, and I know there's gonna be some, some basic foundational skills that the centers of excellence, those who write doctrine and deliver training, leader development won't change. Mm -hmm. But as the Army continually changes and innovates and adapts, so does the institutional brick and mortar delivery of that. Okay. Uh, it could be as something, and I'll, I'll take us back to our young day, when you received a, a big egg carton of box, a, a box of books that was the doctrine that trained and how we, we did our leader development. That's going to change now. I'll give an example I saw just uh, last Friday uh, visiting Fort Greg Adams, uh, okay. CASCOM Center. And we know that the soldiers and leaders coming in, we see it, and I, whatever generation you want to call it, has a level of data literacy and comfort with technology that you and I might not have had back in, when we first met in 1994. Right. Yes, it was really 1994 uh, when we first met. He still uh, looks young, I don't uh, know about me. Well, we'll call it seasoned. But, <laughs> but back to the example, and, and I really commend what this center has done, along with many of the others, is leveraging technology on how they teach, uh, yeah. digital tools, which we didn't see before. Right. And it's really allowing the soldiers to get at their warfighting skills on, on that aspect of it, and then go to the field and leverage a brick and mortar to get them better as well. And here's why I bring that up, bring that up Les. It does demand a relook, potentially, on how we just do traditional brick and mortar education, and it's key. A leveraging technology, linking into the same modernization efforts that the Army's going through now, it could be the next UAS system we're gonna have in a couple of months or a couple of years. Mm -hmm. It could be leveraging the human machine interaction capabilities, which I think we talked, I know we talked about early in the conference. Mm -hmm. And you can't separate that material modernization from the people component training leader development education that takes place. So a long answer for the, the institutional force will modernize and innovate as quickly and in harmony with the operational force well, we're going to have technology taken off, material taken off, and the Army behind it. We're not going to allow that. Right. And the profession of our arms, not only in the warfighting capabilities, but most importantly, I would say equally as important, warfighters of high character, competence, and commitment. Okay. Commitment to our Army values. And we'll focus heavily on that as well. Everywhere from the, from the new soldier leader that comes in, off to the respective school, a basic leader course, war and office course, civilian education system as well. Uh, so they embrace and live part of the DNA on the Army values, embrace the oath that they took, whether it's enlisted oath, officer oath, or civilian professional oath, and, and own it. And when I say own it, us leaders own it as well on standards and discipline and enforcing what our Army is all about. If you take that as a baseline, I'm giving you a long answer here, but you take that as a baseline and couple it with the training leader development nested to the modernization focus of our Army, we will continue to be a kick butt force, okay. bottom line. That's good. So we've focused on the, on the profession before. Yes, you know, we as, have. As we were growing up as uh, young generals, but around 2012, that campaign that General Dipsy had, all of us go up to West Point, do a lot of different things. So that comes to mind. So why, why now? I would say it always has been. Okay. Uh, 
but as I mentioned up front, uh, a, a focus uh, from the 20 years of, of COIN moving on to LISCO, we saw it was a, 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 a moment to, to relook at our profession. And it's definitely not broken. For sure not broken. We have some damn good soldiers and yeah. leaders. It's not broken at all. But it's a continual focus on being good. And okay. we owe that to moms and dads that allow the soldiers to join. And more important, we owe that to those who have joined right. and, and need to be part of the profession. Uh, a little bit off topic, but our, our army is not immune or, or to societal challenges. But we must be better than that. You've heard that before from some of our other leaders. Because we, the, 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 the profession, uh, deploys, fights, and wins, and comes back. Mm -hmm. And on that note, you know, if, you, if you define our army as a professional enterprise, which supports systems that support our soldiers and programs that support our soldiers and families as well, and then hone in on that soldier as a system, you've heard that before, and I'll call them the professional. Right. And every, every investment we put in them, it just needs to be relooked. And, and it, it's critical that we do that and always keep a continual eye on it. Okay. So how, how do you think as we have the generational discussions of how, how can we, how should we be thinking about connecting with our young people and others about this profession discussion? Listen. Okay. For one, do look for inno innovative ways to connect to the soldiers and reinforce the basic blocking and tackling of a profession. And I mentioned in my opening remarks, zero compromise on being good at the basics. And shoot, move, communicate, first aid, you name it, every soldier's gonna have to have that. But also connect the profession on the importance of the values that our Army must have. Right. Uh, and, and I'm not talking any stations of life, wherever you come from and join sure. the military, the importance of the values, being a professional soldier, pride in your uniform, the importance of common task training, uh, blue book type stuff, and just being a professional looking soldier as well, there can be no do in everything that they operate. Roger that. Now, more important to your point on the generational issue, how do you communicate to them? That's right. Um, I don't have my cell phone with me, but that means a lot more to the 18 and 20 year old, even the, the lieutenant and the captain today, than it did in my days. And it feeds into that cohesion that that individual, the professional, is part of the cohesive team uh, to, to fight and win. At the end of the day, we just got to look at it that way mm -hmm. and, and recognize that those soldiers that want to come in, whether we're talking to them when they propense to come in as well or when they join, may, may, may uh, require a different level of delivery and engaged leadership. Right. So l let's d dig a little deep on the profession. So how would you define the Army profession? Mm -hmm. And then what does it mean to you on a personal level? Uh, a professional membership, for one, so on the Army profession. And, and, and so the soldier joining, the leader joining, I am now part of the United States Army. And take seriously the oath that you've taken behind. And the patriotism that comes, comes part of that. So the professional membership clearly needs to be, be part of this. And, and how we fit into that ecosystem of the Army profession. Okay. Then own all that comes with being a professional. I would not call this a nine to five job. Right. Uh, we have an oath. Uh, soldiers do sign contracts as well, and we have values that drive what we do. Mm -hmm. So professional membership, uh, the cohesion and dignity and respect that all, all folks deserve, and you're part of that, and obviously managing their standards and discipline that also keep us underpinned as a professional army, and then own the training requirements to ensure that our soldiers can fight and win as part of the army mm -hmm. is key. Uh, and, and everywhere from the professional identity of, of just looking good when you walk through the airport, and not doing things uh, that would hurt the cohesion uh, that we all want our soldiers to, to be, be part of and our leaders to own. Right, okay, good. So the, um, you talked about the, the components. Is, it, is the profession important at all components and all levels of our Army? When you say components, Guard, Act, National Guard, Active Guard Reserve. Yeah. 100%. Uh, matter of fact, you can take the components piece out of it. Uh, all right. of us, once we put on that uniform and take the oath, own this Army profession. Now, there may be some differences on how we deliver training, you know, whether it's M days or, or, or weekend drills or collective training, uh, but the, the, that part is irrelevant on how you do it as long as it gets done. And, and even 15 years ago, uh, deployments, rotations may be different for respective components, but when you come together as a cohesive team fight and win and, and, and really good at the basic blocking and tackling, ensure the MOS proficiency is there, I would say that it underpins all soldiers joining the Army regardless of the component that they're in. And when you master those three things together, building professional, ensuring that the MOS qualifications are there, same for the officers, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of the specialty branch, 
as branch as not a component agnostic. Right. And you, you shouldn't know uh, when you walk with respect to pr uh, program. Delivery may be a little different based off geographic dispersion and resources available. To tie this back to the trade, the trade doc mission, we will ad adjust whether it's using regional training institutes or leveraging our guard and reserve liaisons to ensure the basics that must be mastered or delivered as all those soldiers are gonna join. And as you well know, there'll be no, no future conflict that doesn't involve that total army That's right. as part of the joint force to ensure we successfully win. Yeah, with our allies and partners. Let, let me deep dive, and, and this question was on the list, but it just hit me. <laughs> uh, so I tell you I was gonna ask you one. So when you commanded a battalion, you were prepared to go into the mission to do the job that you needed to do. Uh, you know, you lost, we lost soldiers, but one of those soldiers that uh, we lost was eventually received the Medal of Honor. Yeah. Can you talk about how you helped prepare your unit and the professionalism that was required, which allowed them to do the task that they had to do at the time uh, of, of that mission? Sure. Uh, well, that soldier was Sergeant First Class Alwyn Cash. Yes. He was a platoon sergeant, 3rd Platoon Alpha Company. Uh, to your exact point, Les, and I talked about the training competency that we want to bring in our leaders. Yeah. What allowed the end state that you just mentioned was trust. Okay. Trust in subordinate leaders yeah. who were resourced, hopefully provided a clear intent, and knew how to get at the training that needed to be done. And at all levels, just prioritize. You know, I'll pick an infantry company. You'll be able to shoot, move, and communicate. Be really good at your task day and night. Here's the resources, time, ammunition to get it done. Here's a clear intent. Go forth and do great things. And you are trusted to do it until proven otherwise. Okay. And then it may take something else. That allowed, not to get into the training path, but that allowed commanders and start, when I say leaders, not just commanders, to operate within the mission and get things done and take care of their troops while doing it. And yeah. that was critical and, and, and prioritized what needed to be done in the timeline that we had. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so from, from our audience, senior leaders this week have emphasized the critical importance of technology and especially harnessing the data and technology enabled decision making. How is TRADOC expediting this skill set into um, into both uniform and civil service mm -hmm. education sure. and career advancement of the Army at sure. all levels. Well, to put it in a sentence is, is taking time to look at the requirements that must be met, the problems to be solved, and taking time to innovate the institutional training base as well. And it won't happen quickly, but it's going to have to happen. Okay. And it could not be more proud of our leaders across the Centers of Excellence and the leadership of the Combined Armor Center nesting very closely but Army Futures Command, AMC, and Forces Command to ensure we can deliver that. Uh, to your point, technology is moving very quickly. Yeah. And it's going to require some different ways on how we deliver it. I'll give one example now through the Combined Arms Center, closely tied to more of our cyber center. He's put together some, some mobile teams to take SMEs, work with PEOs and others, subject matter experts and others, and take this training capability to the field to close that gap up with the technology that's mm -hmm. moving very quickly as we innovate the brick and mortar functional schools and maybe make some new ones mm -hmm. uh, to keep up with that. Pardon my hand on arm analogy, but the, when the M's here, we wanna keep the doctrine leadership development in sync with it. Right. The speed of technology, AI is a great example. Right. It's gonna demand just that. Right, okay. So the, another question for the audience. So as, as the recruiting command has shifted to the, the, chief, the chief and secretary sure. level, what role do we see TRADOC uh, playing in, in recruiting command and the development of those, those soldiers as they come through the pipeline? Well, certainly a 100% total Army effort to support right. the direct reporting mm -hmm. uh, and, and clearly involved because of the long history with the innovations across the training, the recruiting command. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me again, some more Armand Harman, Harman hand signals. Best soldiers identified, soldier leaders, they come in, they're recruited. There's still a, a handoff from when, when Private Smith leaves MEPS onto his respective basic training combat location. Okay. So what might have changed is handshake to first unit assignment. There's still handshakes complete through the first unit assignment. So clear nexus with, with synchronization of training seats, lining up of the MOSs, ensuring that, that those soldiers that come in are very well trained. 
uh, continuous success of the Future Soldier Prep Course, which we've been doing now for about 18 months. So in short, a total Army effort on supporting the innovation and recruiting mm -hmm. and make sure those leaders and soldiers get well-trained and okay. sent to the force. Okay, good. Another question on uh, data technology. So with data technology, AI, growing at such a rapid pace these days, are there discussions or po possibility to modify PME to start teaching data literacy, tech craft, in order to educate our future leaders on this topic? Yes, we have. I've okay. actually had a luxury of a, uh, co-authoring an article with General Rainey on that topic. And okay. He very much had big lead is it, on it. Is it out now? Yes, it came okay. out through the uh, military journals. Oh, great, okay. The Combined Arms Center about four weeks ago. Okay. So make sure you guys go find yeah. that. Yep. But to your exact point, sure. part, of the, part of the initial energy is training the trainer. Okay. Make sure leaders get trained on, on data literacy. And for sure, weave it into PME as well. Take into account for the talent that some of the young soldiers and leaders come to us with. It must happen. Okay. Okay. So earlier this week, the SMA and uh, Trade Act Sergeant Major talked about the revitalization of the Blue Book, which, by the way, was started by the Inspector General Enterprise. Thank you very much. <laughs> and common task training and testing. Can you describe how that links to what you're talking about? I could not be more proud of the efforts that our Sergeant Majors are taking and Sergeant Major Harris, my battle buddy, leading that as well, uh, working that as well. Mm -hmm. Nothing different than what you and I heard a couple of decades ago. So any systems we can put together to ensure soldiers and leaders are validated on the MOS proficiencies, common task training, you've heard it before. Um, the Blue Book will be an updated repository of standards that mm -hmm. are available. And um, we're not looking to put out a big six inch yeah. binder, something small with some QR codes and links. What's the grooming standards for such and such? You hit the link, it takes you to that. Right. The intent is to add some mortar to the brick and mortar okay. on that first line of, of, uh, for readiness for our leaders and, of course, our great non-commissioned officers. So that's the efforts that the sergeant majors as a team, all three components, right. are working as well to ensure there's zero compromise on standards and discipline. One, standards of training and MOS proficiency. And you can even add uh, uh, less ensuring that our troops can go, go for the EIB or the medical badge or something. They got it and mm -hmm. they know it. And, and I would add, it's not only at one entry echelon, it's, it's throughout the continuum of learning. Right. And not to get too geeky on you, but my challenge to the Sergeant Majors and us and, and others, my Sergeant Major, Private Doe gets the same when he comes back for SLC, ALC, you name it. Same right. with the Lieutenant and Bullet, Triple C on. And, it, and it's a continuum of learning so that when you go through an assessment program for command, it just, it's just a process that we're right. ready for. Okay, so uh, another in a, a different venue. What's more important for service members? Maturity mm -hmm. in, or innovation? And how do we maximize the best? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, both. Okay. But I should also go with the assumption an 18 year old and coming in might not have the level of maturity when they join the Army, same for the 20, 23 year lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But if you link that into how we develop soldiers, train soldiers and develop, develop leaders as well, building the cohesion, reps and sets, and reps sure. and sets, and reps and sets for training, all that's going to come. Okay. But clearly, you need to be adaptive and agile enough to feed into the innovation and support it because it's, we're not going to stop it. Just like the iPhone continues to get better and better every single month. Uh, leverage, leverage the innovation, leverage the technology, and also, in a, in a, in a different lens, uh, different lens lens, different lens lens. Less. <laughs> Less, sorry. Yes, sir. Al al allows us to work within any constraints that we may have. Okay. Uh, just, just stay ahead of things and, and then keep that overmatch of our adversaries, uh -huh. which is critical. Okay. So as the Army works to employ more innovative recruiting tactics and attract war fighters from non-traditional backgrounds, how is the profession evolving to complement these efforts? Certainly. As in retain soldiers from non-traditional backgrounds. For example, how is the profession evolving to attract and retain soldiers who are joining in after college or have a professional skill? I won't speak for the, the innovations in the recruiting enterprise sure. that you direct. But I know for sure it's, it's how we seek talent and right. where we go find talent and how we find it. It may be reaching out, which I know those connections have been made to so, some of those that are in the college market now, mm -hmm. and an understanding of how populations may have shifted across the nation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what I will offer up is, regardless of your station of life, here's a great opportunity for you. Right. Um, and if you want to be an infantry soldier, we got it. If you want to be a, get certified as a culinary artist, we got it. And I'm right. sure we give that opportunity for those that, that join. Okay. And get them, get them over the hump if necessary, where academically and physically, our future soldier prep right. course helps to do that. But really casting and, and, and messaging what the Army can do for you and all those opportunities. And tech and STEM are part of them, and equally as important as the person that wants to be the crew member of a tank or a Bradley. Right. So let's, let's pull that a little bit. So uh, the, the, this great senior list of leaders uh, talked about this. So the uh, future soldier prep course. Tell me about what, what you think about how, how does that help change the calculus mm -hmm. for our Army when it comes to accepting soldiers and the standards associated from that? Certainly. We're closing in. I know we're over 15,000, closing on 16,000 that okay. have gone through since the inception, about 18 months now. Uh, now, what we're doing as an enterprise to uh, adapt and innovate is expanding it. Okay. We're, nucleus was at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I've spread some of the training down to Fort Moore, former Fort Benning, mm -hmm. and have other installations as well, uh, Leonard Wood and Sill, that we can expand mm -hmm. to also to meet the demand. Okay. Um, without getting into all, to all the specifics, what it has been doing and continues to do is a young soldier, young man or woman who has a propensity and desire to serve, who may need an academic boost or a physical boost, whether it was just from challenges with the abs fab for whatever reasons, or fitness obesity issues, which is prevalent nationally, mm -hmm. it gives them an opportunity to get beyond that and to seek an MOS that they mm -hmm. want to join. Okay. Uh, great, great success. And that feeds right into attrition when they get to their first general assignment, which is luck, unfortunately, very low. And then also re-enlistment in the bigger army, which is also very, very high, yeah. which is good. That's good. Uh, so I, I see this as an opportunity that's probably going to be enduring for some time. Uh, of course, hopefully not the only solution for, to continue to bring soldiers in. And this, this is a national problem. Yes. Just not an, an Army problem. Yes. But this is a, a, a solution that is really helping uh, fill the ranks, but more importantly, really identify some great soldiers that want to serve. And I could, we're, we're 85, 90, and higher than 95 percent in some of the success rates, which okay. show you when you I'll give it, without mentioning names, a great example. We've had some soldiers that have lost 60 or more pounds. Wow. Because they good sleep, better sleep in some respects. Had some that told me this is the first time in four years I've had three good meals a day. I'm yeah. not exaggerating. I'm I believe not making it. that up. Yeah. And just knowing how to exercise and it has made a big difference. And then some through some, some superb teaching and coaching through our, 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 our education instructors on how to take a test. Yeah. And that's made a difference. And I think we're finally getting beyond... Uh, some of the lagging impacts of COVID when mm -hmm. school doors were closed, one on the recruiting aspect. Yeah. And some so, uh, young men and women who admittedly didn't learn well at home yeah. over the laptop. Yeah. So uh, this is a compo one, two, and three question. So your experience in First Army have provided insights for both recruiting and retention. So keeping our professional soldiers in our ranks is just as important. How are we sharing our lessons learned in collaboration with uh, Jody Daniels and John Jensen? Well, I'm, I feel very fortunate that okay. I have an active uh, National Guard and a Reserve General Office Liaison attached to the command. And across many of the centers of excellence also have mm -hmm. corresponding uh, liaisons attached to their respective centers as well. Mm -hmm. Some are not full time, some are, uh, but sharing all that with their commands who assist in the recruiting space. And of course, different goals and procedures for one. I know you, Sir, does a superb job of that. Mm -hmm. More importantly, less. Uh, I mentioned that um, re-enlistment is off the charts in a very good way. It was last year, hopefully will continue this year as well. So what we're seeing when you give, when you focus on the quality of life, focus on the enterprise as a whole, and ensure that young soldier, any soldier, any leader mm -hmm. is really good in their basic blocking and tackling and trained well, yeah, it, it just builds into the profession. Okay. The profession of arms and ownership of it and they know I'm part of a great organization and stay in. Okay. So those types of lessons are shared. Well, kind of tied to that, uh, you know, we've talked about the Center for Army Profession uh, in our prep call. Apple, yeah. Yeah, and then the uh, uh, Castle survey. What reflections are you seeing about the survey? Explain to everybody what, what that survey is and then sure. what are you seeing about that survey? Yeah. Uh, through our Combined Arms Center, well, we send it out to the field and get some feedback from leaders on what they're seeing in a variety of demographics and get an assessment Mm -hmm. on leadership development, leadership performance, soldier performance in the, in the field without going into too many details. Uh, I want to hook this back to an earlier question you asked me about how are we innovate in enterprise sure. as well. 
So when we send out the survey this year, um, and we're, we're in, the, in the midst of setting it up, is are there, are there too many questions? Are the questions focused? Are they answering what we want, what we need for the Army to make it better? Just like the Castle survey is already done. So that process is being innovated as well. And, and we're, we're testing that and beta testing it and sampling it so that what we get out of it feeds back into something that allows for some level of improvement, mm -hmm. either for the senior leaders, could be PME, or gee, this, we're not doing this the right way. So that's what this professional survey uh, through Capital and, and the, uh, the leadership survey is doing for us. And I realize there, there are a lot of surveys out there, so why not make it innovative and something that we're going to get out, something will come out of it to make our army better. Okay. And it may highlight some things that aren't going well as well, uh, which we, we can focus on. So using that study to, as, as one of the many tools in the kit bag for the army profession mm -hmm. uh, will help us for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as a, as a trade out commander in the army lead for strengthening the profession, Tell us some of the areas that you want to focus on as, as the top leader in that field. One that has not is ageless, being really good at the basic blocking and tackling at the respective echelon that you're in. I cannot underscore that enough, and maybe it's a little bit of an old school focus uh, so that we have our war fighting readiness. That's where it starts. And when you have that coupled with just being a good person, mm -hmm. which it could be defined as you know, great character, you know, values and, and norms, uh, a high level of competence in your respective skill set at your respective pay grade, mm -hmm. and then committed. So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the focus that we take. Uh, also in support of a, a priority of the, of the chief of staffs, which I'm 100% on, support to the Harding Project. It's right. essentially a venue to generate professional discourse. And you and I may recall from our, from our young days, the glossy magazines that were out there. Yes. They still do exist. Why not have the same thing available on the cell phone? We're right. doing that as well. To generate professional discourse and dialogue. It doesn't need to be from my rank or the Sergeant Major's rank. It'd be dynamite when Captain Smith, hey, this is what I'm going on in my last NTC rotation on my deployment to, to Poland. Right. It generates dialogue, uh, discussion, and you might find something innovative out of it, like how I employed UAS in such a part of the world. Yeah. Uh, so professional dialogue, for one. Okay. And uh, then, if I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Continue. A tie to this, and you asked this question earlier, is do not take our eye off of standards and discipline through the blue book, common task training, you name it. Again, it's just more mortar and that first layer of bricks, which is, which clearly underpins our Army profession in all aspects. Okay. Okay, so um, recruitment of soldiers is often focused on exciting jobs or roles of duty. Has any thought been made to promote the education military training provides? or the utility of military experience on the job market once you leave? Yes, and we happen to have owners, uh, a lead on the Soldier for Life program and are working with HRC as well on a okay. transition assistance program. We talked about the umbrella of innovation. That's one of them. Um, so in the command, I can't quote an exact number, but we're looking at all of our training to see where it can provide a validated certification to soldiers. I'll give you an example in a moment something they could use in service yes. for continued development, and then out of service for continued development. Uh, I, matter of fact, I talked earlier about if you want to come in and be a cook, culinary artist. Sure. We're going to send you to professional schools. You can go to more professional schools and, and competitions and get certified in that. We teach you how to drive a hit. You can get certified on that and use it for John Deere when you yep. get out of the CDL, Army. CDL, that's right. So, so that is getting better. And then within uniform, and this is part of an innovative approach on how we develop troops and leaders, and this is new on giving, uh, I'll use the word constructive credit, but validating education and training that you may have had, even if you came from another service sure. or, or transferred into another uh, specialty to feed into the profession of arms and developing you. Uh, if you switch from, say, infantry to whatever, another branch, do I need to send you back to 22-week OSIT? Probably not. Maybe you can get credit for what you've learned as an E5 or E6 already, and then we give you some of the upper-level education. So, sure. so that's a way to do it. And most importantly, that supports our families and then being a true soldier for life when you change your ID card. Sure. And that, that's big. Yeah, that's big. As we, a lot of us have figured out about changing that, that ID <laughs> card. So uh, as, we, as we close out, if you were to tell your young self, you know, of all the stuff we talked about, about the profession, what would you tell your young self to tell our young people about what this service has done for you, what this has done for you becoming an Army professional? Mm -hmm. Well, really, just to simply love being part of a really good team. Yeah. And it, it just keeps you in. 
That's, that's an interesting question, Les. If I, if I had to go back now and talk to a group or whatever, um, is realize that you are continuing to grow, learn, self-study, and get better every day. And guess what, Captain Smith? You don't have all the solutions, but it's okay. You have someone in your organization that can help us get from there to here right. and continue to get better. And it's all right. That's what this is all about, the true profession, uh, just making this Army engine run. That's good. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause for General Gary Brito, Third Eye Commander. Thank you, Les. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, sir. I'm going to the podium now. That's right. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to AUSA's panel on synchronizing modernization to realize future capabilities. I'm Dan Roper, AUSA's Director of National Security Studies. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your support to AUSA this week, but more importantly for your support to the Army, its soldiers, its families, its Army civilians. It, it is all it's what, what everybody here is here for. The, the topics we saw this week demonstrated the need to synchronize the many modernization efforts that the U.S. Army has got going on, as explained to us. It's the imperative, if we're going to have to focus on the synchronization if we'll be able to continuously transform as the Chief has directed. We've got a great panel assembled for you today to help discuss through those issues, led by Lieutenant General Retired Dick Formica, who served in the U.S. Army for 36 years in a number of positions of great responsibility, including three Corps Artillery Commander, the Joint Fires and Effects Cell in Iraq, the Commander of the Combined Security Transition Command in Afghanistan, and of interest to the people in this room and in this community, is the Commander of the Space and Missile Defense Command right here in Huntsville. But before we turn it over to General Formica and his panel, we're privileged to have General Brito agreed to stay around with us and, and kick off this panel with some remarks about this very important subject. General Brito, over to you. Thanks, sir. Well, I'll just walk there now. <laughs> okay, on. Uh, I'll just stay outside the podium team. Again, thank you so much. I'm just going to be a quick minute. We may ask it as a big leap from the strengthening the Army profession and Army profession to synchronize and modernization, and I would argue and suggest zero. It's not a big leap at all, and you cannot break the two of these apart. We talked to some of that a bit when uh, General Smith and I were discussing things as well. So the Army profession underpinning this connection and synchronization of modernization, I know we've seen that through, through much that you discussed today. Mr. Formica and the panel members, again, thank you for the opportunity to address this, this, this situation, this, uh, command, this topic. Uh, clearly a necessary and a good and healthy working relationships across all the ACOMs and very closely with Army Futures Command and TRADOC to tackle this issue when it comes to the synchronization, the important synchronization across all the DOTLAM PF and you, you're aware of what the acronym is. To keep some synergy and, and an important pace uh, uh, with the modernization and all the doctrine, organization, training, and development that supports it is what the theme of this distinguished panel will give you today. So I can't underscore the importance of that. And our armies working hard together, uh, soldiers, leaders, civilian professionals as well, to help advance our chief of staff's priorities and our secretary's priorities also. And then stay focused on continual transformation, the speed of technology, and the importance of underpinning all the Dotland PF and that first layer of bricks for combat readiness. So really happy as a command and a soldier to be part of that, and even more happy, sir, Mr. Paul Mike, and I turn the mic over to you and the team, and thank you so much for, for what I know will be a rich discussion. Thank you. General Brito, thanks. Well, thank you. And thanks to Dan Roper for, uh, for your introduction. We appreciate your service in our Army and at AUSA. I'd like to start off by thanking AUSA for organizing this annual symposium here in Huntsville. It's been a great couple days already and uh, we look forward to finishing strong this morning. I'd like to add my special thanks to AUSA for all that it does every day for our Army, our soldiers, and our civilians and their families. 
This week, we heard from senior Army leaders on continuous transformation to deliver combat-ready formations. So, as General Brito said, this panel will focus on synchronizing modernization to realize future capabilities, something we've heard a lot about during the course of the conference already. Now, capability development is a critical part of the continuous transformation process. You see, it all begins with the strategy. What do you want the Army to do? Then, importantly, what capabilities does the Army need to have to meet that strategy? Those capabilities are identified through the formulation of operational concepts and the identification of capability gaps. And those gaps are not expressed solely in materiel. So this panel will recognize the importance of integrating modernization, materiel, with .LPF, Doctrine, Organization, Training, Leader Development, Personnel, Facilities, and Policy. To lead this conversation, TRADOC and AUSA have assembled a distinguished lineup whose experience and current responsibilities give them unique and informed perspectives on this important topic. So we look forward to sharing these perspectives with you and importantly, taking your questions. Again, thanks to General Brito, the CG of uh, US Army TRADOC for kicking the panel off. I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, on my right, Dr. Paul Reese, the director of the Fielded Force Integration Directorate at the United States Army Combined, Center, Combined Arms Center, U.S. Army TRADOC. Then we'll hear from Colonel Jason West, the director of the TRADOC Proponent Office for, synthetic training in, for the Synthetic Training Environment at United States Army Training and Doctrine Command. And then finally, Ms. Susan Hawkins, the Senior Director of Strategy and Mission Solutions, Navigation, Targeting, and Survivability Division at Northrop Grumman. So, similar to the other panels you've heard this week, the approach we'll take is each of the panelists will start off with some opening comments. Uh, I have a question or two to kick this thing off, and then we, we should have uh, close to 50 minutes to handle your questions and answers, and we look forward to those coming in. And then we'll finish with each panel member uh, making their closing comments. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Reese, sir, for your comments. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody this morning? Oh, very good. Uh, as you said, I'm Dr. Paul Reese. Uh, I'm a retired armor officer, armor officer and now an Army civilian professional. And I work with uh, General Beagle at the Combined Arms Center, which is part of the TRADOC Enterprise underneath uh, General Brito. Uh, but we also work in support of General Rainey and Army Futures Command uh, as we look to keep the current force and the, fielded, uh, the current fielded force in tune and linked to the future force, all part of uh, the Army. So over the last couple of days, you've heard a lot about material requirements, where the Army is heading uh, on, in those lanes. There is no doubt in my mind that Army Futures Command, they saw with the PEOs and PMs, uh, the professionals here in the room today, all those in the exhibit halls down the, down the way will deliver the best capability that our Army can have uh, in the future. There's no doubt uh, there's been a lot of discussion about dot mil PF and the integration of requirements uh, and the integration of those material fieldings as they come to our force. So today we're going to expand that conversation uh, that we've had over the last couple of days and really talk about dot mil PF integration uh, capability solutions, not necessarily requirements, but the solutions that we need uh, for the fielded force. And that's where TRADOC, the Combined Arms Center, uh, and the Centers of Excellence come in uh, to provide those solutions for our Army. As you heard from several senior leaders over the last couple of days and several of the Center of Excellence commanders, uh, that it is critical that we deliver that full solution to our force. General Rangi yesterday talked about the criticality uh, of the development of our leaders, our training environment, our organizations, and our doctrine as we modernize and transform our army. So specifically, that's why I'm here today and that's why I'm on the panel. As we work dot mil PF integration uh, for Army 2030 as part of the Army's continuous transformation, the deliberate transformation phase uh, over the FIDEP, which is the next two uh, to seven years. As we have heard from Army senior leaders, the U.S. Army is undergoing the most significant transformation since the end of the Cold War in order to make sure we maintain our advantages over our enemies. 
we have to transform, and Army 2030 is part of that transformation. Army 2030 builds on multi-domain operations. It builds multi-domain capabilities at every echelon as part of large-scale combat operations in order to defeat uh, a peer adversary and provide decisive capabilities to the joint force. It builds on the capability gaps that we identified during the large-scale combat operations study. Uh, so what we have learned before, we build on those capabilities and provide solutions to the Army. It provides a pathway for modernization, and that includes landing spots uh, for technology uh, as it matures. And Army 2030 is also flexible enough to adapt to the lessons learned that we're seeing in the Russian-Ukraine conflict with Israel and Hamas and other places around the globe. And now most recently, the lessons that we're learning from the Chief's direction on continuous uh, transformation and contact as we transform our units and experiment with capabilities uh, that are coming to the force. As part of this deliberate transformation, we must make sure that the doctrine, training, organization, leader development, et cetera, are all synchronized and delivered at the same time so we can realize the full capability uh, of what is being fielded to our force. This holistic plan ensures that we just don't provide new material to our soldiers. Many of us have had the experience of receiving a new vehicle, some type of new protection device, uh, and we had no idea how to employ it. We had no idea what the second and third order effects were of turning that system on. We didn't know how to uh, use it, train with it, protect it, etc. And most of that time we got that while we were in contact with the enemy and we had to do on-the-job training. And that was just unsatisfactory. So what we are doing in TRADOC is not only making sure that that doesn't happen again, um, but we are making sure that we transform our army for the future across the full .mil PF. A robot is just a robot. But if you have the right leaders with the right mindset, with the right vision, and the right training, you now have an incredible capability. So how do we get after that? We must first know, as Mr. Formica, just General Formica just said, we need to know where we're going in the future. We need to stay linked with the armor warfighting concept, and TRADOC stays very closely linked with Futures and Concept Center and where we're heading uh, with the new warfighting concept. We must know what we are modernizing. What are we building? What are we fielding? What are those signature modernization efforts that are coming and being delivered to the Army? We must know how this comes together and impacts the way we fight and the way we design our Army. And we see that through experiments and exercises, things like project convergence that we've been talking a lot about over the last couple of days. Then we execute a deliberate plan across Stop Mill PF to deliver that full solution that General Brito talked about, uh, and as well as General Formica in his opening comments. So on a micro level, as Army Futures Command and ASALT delivers a capability like the new tank, the M10 Booker, we have to make sure uh, that we have the tactics, techniques, and procedures in place to fight that piece of equipment. The, it, is chance, it will transform how the IBCT, the Infantry Brigade Combat Team, fights to have that capability inside their formations. We must make sure we're ready to employ it properly. We must make sure we have the right training devices in place, not only for the crew to be able to shoot, uh, but the maneuver ranges in order to be able to, to practice uh, in a training environment with that capability, both live and in virtual. We must make sure we update the programs of instructions not only for the crews, but for the battalion commanders, the sergeant majors, the company commanders, and first sergeants, so they know how to employ that capability immediately. And then we must make sure we have the facilities to take care of it. This synchronization allows for the immediate employment and the full realization of that particular capability tonight, and not three years later after we had some time to understand it. At the micro level, TRADOC and the proponents are updating our doctrine. If you haven't, who's, who in the audience has read the new FM30 operations that deals with multi-domain operations? Wow. All right, we got a few on the front, not very many in the back. Must, that's okay, though. If you don't want to read it, you don't have to anymore, right? Because now you can get on and you can listen to a podcast about FM30. If you don't like podcasts, you can do the audio book. So when you're sitting in traffic or sitting at the airport. So we, part of that transformation that General Brito talked about is how do we take our doctrine to the next level and make sure uh, that our Army is educated on the way we fight. We've also improved our designs at every level in order to be ready for the new equipment that's being delivered. We have improved our OP4 at our training centers to make sure they replicate our enemies and provide that best test for their forces as they go to that collective training environment. 
We've improved our PME at all levels and at all cohorts, and we've identified all those things that our facilities need for the future. Uh, so we continue to work that piece of it as we go forward. And I, want, <clears throat> I will end now in saying the integration and timing of .mil PF uh, is a team sport. It's key to our success on the battlefield, and it is key to ensure that we don't just field a, a widget to our force, but we field a true capability across .mil PF. I look forward to our questions this morning and conversation that we're about to have. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Reese. Colonel West. Hey, good morning. Uh, Colonel Jason West, Director of TRADOX Proponent Office for Synthetic Training Environment. And I have to admit, I had a uh, pretty long monologue uh, about uh, all the great things uh, that we wanted to talk about today, but there was such a great day one and day two. What I really want to cut to is what I do and how I'm going to block and tackle with the teammates up here to get after that dot mil PF integration. And so first off, I want to thank AUSA, General Brown, uh, General Brito, uh, General Rainey, Lieutenant General Vermica for the, for the invite uh, and allowing me to come up here. It, it is a humble honor uh, to be a part of this group and this team. Uh, for those wondering what a, tr a TPO, TRADOC Proponent Office, does, if you're familiar with the TRADOC Capability Managers, the name might have changed, but the mission has not. We continue to manage a capability or a specific capability based on our portfolio for the Army. You also might ask, well, then what's an Army Capability Manager? Um, that Army Capability Manager does the same thing that a TPO does. We manage a capability for the Army. The only difference is, is who we report to. And so for a TPO, we report to TRADOC. And for an, an ACM or an ACM, they report to AFC. So I work for Brigadier General uh, Scott Woodward, uh, who is the uh, Deputy Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center for Training. I work for Lieutenant General Beagle, uh, who is the Commanding General of the Combined Arms Center, and I work for General Brito, the TRADOC CG, who we just heard of. And it's through the TRADOC CG, through General Brito, where TPOSD is granted the, th the authority uh, to act as TRADOC's centralized planner, manager, and integrator for all capability developer user, uh, user activities associated with implementing and synchronizing the synthetic training environment. And so that's where I start to plug in with my organization and adopt mil pf integration. And to accomplish our charter, I have a couple teammates in that. You would think that just because it says synthetic training environment in the title that it is every, everything under the synthetic training environment is underneath my organization. And that is actually incorrect. If you look back at that charter, it is to manage, it's the planner, it's the integration of that training strategy in that environment where, uh, where those authorities lie for my organization. And so I work alongside a, a, a great bunch of uh, civilians, Army professional civilians, uh, military contractors in the Na National Simulation Center. Uh, who have that constructive environment underneath them. You might be familiar with Jalictic, the Joint Land Component Collective Training Capability, which is a mouthful. I also work uh, alongside TPO Live, TRADOC Proponent Office Live, which is out at Fort Husis, uh, which has systems like your iMiles uh, that you're familiar with. And they also provide oversight for some of our ra training ranges that we have. And so with them, we are the team, the CAC, what I like to call the CAC-T STE Council of Colonels. Uh, that really look at the live, virtual, and constructive training environments in this dot mil PF integration. And so my day job, my day job is to manage what I like to call our proven capabilities, but there are legacy capabilities, right? And you might be familiar with some of them. Uh, that includes the engagement skills trainer, EST. That includes the close combat tactical trainer, uh, the uh, CCTT. That includes the aviation combined arms tactical trainer, the AVCAT. And, and a few others. And those are non-system uh, training aids, devices, simulators, and simulations. And so we're really at the collective level when we talk about uh, systems uh, and training systems. And our job is communicating those gaps in training today uh, through dot mil P PF analysis, working with Dr. Reese's team uh, to modernize the training aids and devices we have today so that we can keep up with the continuous transformation uh, so that we can deliver ready combat forces. And furthermore, we not only do this with Dr. Reese's team, but we do it across inside of CAC-T in a triad relationship. And that relationship consists of the cross-functional uh, team synthetic trained environment, STE, who is the requirements owner, 
and Requirements Manager uh, who are in Orlando, Florida. And if also the other part of that uh, triad is the Program Executive Office Synthetic Training Environment uh, and Instrumentation, PEO Stry, who is the material developer. And it's that team where we inform through dot mil PNF analysis, those gaps, we get that to the requirements owner, who then communicates that to the material developer and ultimately uh, integrated with our industry partners. And some of those systems you may be familiar with. Um, we are just now approaching our first ever uh, synthetic training environment software that's going before a uh, requirements oversight council uh, uh, in May. And that is for uh, the training uh, simulation software our training management tool in One World Terrain. Now that also is what we've been charged with as we talk about delivering things fast. Uh, we once were going to look at delivering next generation constructive, gelictic, uh, where we were projecting somewhere between 28 and 30. Well, we've now been charged to bring that forward to FY26. So if you talk about delivering something quickly, uh, we've been charged with that and we're right in the throes of that as we speak. You're probably familiar with the Reconfigurable Vehicle Collective Trainer, RVCT, and also the, surgical, the Soldier Virtual Trainer, SVT, which is our EST replacement, and our live training systems, which will be our miles replacement. Uh, but you've heard from a lot of great leaders, and so what I, I do want to do is that we get, get through the in introductions and get to Miss Susan Hawkins and uh, really get into the Q&A, but I really believe we are in a once-in-a-generation transformational change once again I look forward to the discussion and the integration with the panel members uh, and with the audience. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Colonel West. Ms. Hawkins. Thank you very much. Um, so this is uh, kind of encouraging. You guys may not realize this, but we didn't share all of our notes ahead of time. But to see the synchronization, actually, of the conversation is very encouraging because all of our different perspectives are are working toward the same imperative. So my name is Susan Hawkins. I'm with Northrop Grumman in the mission systems area of navigation targeting survivability. My background is about two and a half decades in the national security and defense industry, spanning all the services, all the different services and working both within you know, the solution service side of the house as well as uh, material. And my most recent experience is in the product development area. And so I'm gonna focus you know, my conversation today around that and bringing in material and how our approach to how we, we produce our solutions with you and collaboration with you um, helps support the dot mil PF integration. Um, so it's not unusual for future capabilities to have a target fielding date, and I know we talk about the Army of 2030 and 2040, for example, and we recognize those of us who are producing uh, the solutions, particularly on the mission solution side, that you know, that's really about having that full dot mill um, integration, not just dropping a material in the hands of the warfighter, right, at, at, at a particular time. So, um, and we know that you can't leverage the capability, and, and Dr. Reese mentioned that, you can't leverage the capability uh, without the rest of the dot mill PF being complete. So how can we do this together is by fielding the early known advancements today on today's platforms and getting them into your hands in the field and iterating through the dot mil PF with technology maturation because operational concepts are outpacing requirements. And I don't know of a more powerful way of synchronizing modernization to future capabilities than this. So we can modernize the current fleet with the best solutions available today de-risk the development of future capabilities, and then simultaneously mature and test the training, the CONOPS, the TTPs throughout the entire process. Now, I recognize that we do not have the luxury of standing still to focus on modernization. There are budget challenges with maintaining readiness and modernizing simultaneously. This is the reality we all are living in together. So because of this, smart modernization is you know, tied to your future capabilities is even more important because you want your modernization efforts to be your stepping stone into the future. And we can do this. So the Army's pivot to demonstrations and experimentation is an important step in the right direction. Combining this with the OTA and MTA acquisition constructs, there's a path for collaboration and speed 
And so I challenge you to look internally and make sure that you're leveraging all the collaboration aspects available to you with these vehicles. And additionally, there will always be technology advancements and standards continuously evolving. But don't let that get in the way of fielding known, capable solutions which do not force permanent trades. And that's the second key for synchronization. Threats and corresponding solutions will continue to evolve. Synchronization is about a path to the future. A path of no longer having to make permanent trades is a powerful stepping stone when implemented correctly. So MOSA architecture is a prime example of this. The Army has invested dearly and has very capable solutions. Fielding this across the current fleet will allow the Army to rapidly integrate new capabilities and assist in the implementation of the solutions of the future, including the next generation of MOSA. Once you have MOSA out there, you can scale on the Army's success points in getting production representative prototypes into the field quickly. It's all about shortening the timeline without introducing unnecessary risk. And learning how to do this in the MOSA construct now with your partners, that whole ecosystem that you work with, will create a machine of invention for the future. Another opportunity to fuel synchronization is leveraging cross-service investments. Shared investment in core technologies provides a more viable roadmap to the future due to multiple funding streams and use cases. And we have seen on industry side a sea change in your behavior and the services that is wonderfully impactful. And this is, you guys are turning away from the not invented here mentality. And it is notable. And I am not suggesting another JPO. I'm talking about looking beyond your requirements and investigating what your sister services are doing and asking yourself, does this solve part of my problem? Can I start there instead of at the beginning? And I have a great example for you guys that has to do with the Army. The Army invested in an EW capability for the rotary fleet. This capability was used as a foundation for an Air Force solution in which the Air Force further invested in both the core tech as well as their form factor and mission requirements, and it became a new program of record for a fighter jet. When that was complete, the Army saw the Air Force fighter jet solution and now is recognizing this as a capability for their special mission fixed wing. So how can a solution grow from rotary, an advanced solution, grow from rotary to fixed wing, to um, rotary, to a fast jet, to a fixed wing, across multiple services, is by leveraging your sister services and, and taking what you can get from that and getting that into your domain and mission set. And in industry, the way we help with that is we call it product line development. And it's approach some of us are taking to enable the shift more rapidly. It supports cost-effective advancements in core solution capabilities. It's about using an architecture and a design process around a core tech base that can be adaptive to unique mission sets. And it is proving that you can rapidly leverage capabilities into new solutions to close the capability gap, bringing the future closer to today. And when you combine product line development with modular architecture, when you design with sustainment in mind, you can simplify the sustainment process, potentially allowing for home station modernization on the ramp, in the motor pool, for many more advanced solutions than what we see today. Before I close, I wish to touch at a very high level around another important area that enables the synchronization of modernization to the future the collaboration with the Army in the digital environment, and this has been notable. It's using model-based systems engineering. We're birthing systems today that have a digital thread, enabling the future much faster. And the great thing is that as we move legacy systems over to the virtualized solution, we are fusing data in ways we were not able to before, and we are doing this today on current platforms. And the secondary benefits are tremendous and include greater ease of creating the synthetic training environments, as well as supporting embedded training using real mission data. 
In closing, the Army and industry collaboration is vital for the successful synchronization of modernization to your future warfighting needs. As partners, we need to take full advantage of the contracting approaches, demonstrations, and digitization to not just experiment and explore, but to field now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, and thank you to the panel. Um, some of the questions have started to come in, and we'll get to those here in a second. But before I dive deep into those specific questions, I want to stay at the higher level for a second. Yesterday, when General Rainey talked, he spoke about the three time horizons for transformation. Transform and contact, deliberate transformation, concept-based tra uh, transformation. Next two years, two to seven years, and then beyond. It strikes me that the implications of bringing .mil PF together is different or unique in each of those three time horizons. And I'd like to give the panel an opportunity to reflect on what some of those differences might be and what are the challenges that they face. Paul? No, thanks, sir. Appreciate that. So I think, no, I think you're exactly right. And I think um, when we think about deliberate transformation and by definition of deliberate, right, we have normal army processes that allow us to keep pace and, and develop our doctrine, our training, et cetera, as we go forward. Uh, but I do think um, as we get into uh, transformation and contact and we start looking at some of the units uh, that are getting ready to go through that and some of the prototype equipment that's being fielded to them now, uh, what TRADOC is doing is making sure that we have collection teams that are prepared to assist with that. So we start at the very beginning level with the proponents. So as we look at a, uh, a IBCT, an infantry brigade combat team that's going through transition and contact, uh, the maneuver center as the proponent has been deeply involved with them and, and, and lockstep with them as they go forward. But the rest of the TRADOC enterprise, them, as they go through their collective training, uh, as they go through a deployment, uh, then we need to stay in touch with them, descend upon them to, to get those lessons, what worked, what didn't work, what technology was good, how did that affect the way we fight, how does it affect the way we need to train our soldiers, et cetera. So uh, we'll, we'll have to stay in tune with them capture all that, make those changes as best we can, but then go back to the deliberate process to make sure that we secure uh, it long-term and then can scale it for the Army. Uh, that's, I think, the key where the deliberate process comes in as well. Uh, yes, sir. It, 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 and so the way I look at those, um, in, a, in a word that I, I normally don't use a lot, I, I talk a lot about capability management, requirements management, acquisition. Uh, and the, and when, when we put in the light of training development, and especially what we heard the leaders talk about, and we look across those horizons, I really see when we go through our traditional requirements processes, I do see that in that deliberate transformation timeline. I think where we see what General Rainey talked about yesterday, um, directed requirements in the prototype development, I do see that as that transformation in contact. Uh, and if you were really to phase it and look at it, the concept-driven framework, we, we do a really great job of dot mil PF analysis when we look out far. What do we have now? What is the technology showing us we'll have in the future? Where are the gaps when we look at MDO and look out? And as you come into that timeline, as you get into that two to seven range, you get to deliberate. That is where your requirements, I think your process, um, your deliberate requirements processes, your traditional ones come into, uh, come into play. And then that prototype, what are those directed requirements, what are those things that we're seeing right now in the battlefield, and then transition to that a physical agility to get those now, while we continue some of the enduring processes that we're absolutely familiar with, uh, but also pick that speed up. I think he said 10 times was the pace yesterday that he talked about. That's fast. That's extremely fast. I would say that's unprecedented for what we're used to. Uh, in our traditional systems and processes. And so that's what I think about uh, with that question and what our senior leaders are talking about and the way we're looking into the future, sir. Great, thanks. Ms. Hawkins, did you have any comments on that or you want to put, take a pass? No, I just think that, um, you know, back to where, when the, where the material affects this is as we digitize, right? It, it will help shorten across the entire dot mil PF. And I'm talking about the, you know, I'm, I'm suggesting really from the full life cycle, like even when it comes to training in a virtual synthetic environment, how you create that, how you're moving the models from what you're developing right into the training environment, how quickly you can do that. But I mean, the future really comes down to, you know, the potential for embedded training. So if, if it's, you have a capability, you, you, 
end up having in wartime um, engaging and seeing something new, right? Because the platform's digitized, the systems are digitized, that data, how you maneuver through that, when you get back, it is immediately accessible, transmittable, you can learn from it. I mean, that's the future that we see as one of the powers of the digitization of the mission solutions, so. Go ahead. It, sir, if we could, we could try to talk about an example maybe uh, to relate in that, it, it, and I'm gonna try to compare a, a system that we still have today with, with something we have coming on board. And so when we go back and look at uh, the Striker, when we brought the Striker on board, it affected 80 courses, five different school systems. So when we talk leader development, education, um, that's what the Striker did. And as we bring on the M10 Booker, right, it's the same thing that we've got to look at and where does it fall within those horizons, right? You will see a different dot mil PF for a, for a longer drawn out or I need to have this system today. And as you go through each of those, each of those um, acronyms and dot mil PF and you go through the charts, they may change even in where they're at in completion as you look across the system. Our ranges will change when we look at that. We have weapon systems today that we know of with next-gen squad weapons, some of our sniper rifles, some of our long-range precision fires that we don't even have ranges that can support some of these capabilities that we have today, which falls under facilities when we think about ranges. Uh, and so that I do see and is also being a challenge as we look across each of those time horizons, how is that development, continuous development, and if it does slip into another um, another one of those um, horizons. How does that change what we look at in dot mil PF and where we're tracking what's complete, what's not, and then what continues? You could almost argue that everything stays amber uh, because we're gonna be in a continuous, uh, continuous transformation. And then there, and, and I'll, I'll talk about a book. I, I actually listened to it on a flight uh, coming up here uh, called The Inevitable. Uh, the author, I think it was in the prologue or in the first chapter, talked about everyone being newbies. And I couldn't help but think that um, the challenges that, that we have with the agility we're gonna have to have as trainers because of this continuous transformation that we're gonna have to keep up with the threat, um, keep up with what's there in the operational environment. And we are gonna be a bit of newbies, I think, as we go through this uh, continuous transformation. And how do we also get into our schoolhouses and that foundational, um, uh, uh, classrooms that we get after uh, to keep up with a lot of that technology that's coming out to our formations. Okay, thanks. Um, the, the first question uh, from the audience, um, Jason, it's to you, but with the permission of the uh, author of the question, I'm going to try to broaden it. Um, the, the question says, thanks for laying out what we have in terms of training capabilities and the need to upgrade those to new capabilities but a recurring challenge for our Army's total force is to ensure emerging new and evolving capabilities like STE are available to our Guard and Reserve formations and available to them to train. So I'm gonna ask Jason to answer that, but then really the question is, as we synchronize dot mil PF for transformation, how are we looking to do that for a total force across all three compos? So first to Jason, because you got the question by name, and then we'll broaden it, broaden it up. And, and thank you uh, to whoever wrote that. And one of the greatest challenges with our, with our compos is they use a lot uh, of our synthetic training environment. They, they proportionally use more of it uh, in, in many cases, depending on the system than our active component. And so those challenges, and as we look at the fiscal challenges uh, that we face, um, that's something that we look at, uh, look at extensively. And it's also difficult to partner uh, uh, at times, uh, depending on when someone's available. Uh, and so we do uh, incorporate uh, our COMPO 2 and COMPO 3 uh, into various uh, uh, forums. Uh, we have our TGOSCs, our training GOSCs that we bring them into. We have our uh, training support system, Enterprise, TSSE, that we bring, uh, bring them into. But I do see the challenges. We hear the challenges. Uh, I know that we're going through that right now with the, the reconfigurable collective trainers. We're going through that with our engagement skills trainers uh, as we look at the total number of sites, what we're delivering, who we're delivering to, who needs it most uh, as we move forward. Um, and and we do, it's duly noted that that challenge does exist uh, as we move forward. 
And uh, we're trying to close that gap as we look at uh, uh, this transformation, this pivotal point. Uh, while we're right between an engagement skills trainer, we're right between the SVT and modernizing it, we're right between the CCTT and AVCAT uh, divestment and bringing on RVCT as it re its replacement. And that probably didn't answer the question, um, but just acknowledge that we know that challenge exists. No, sure, and I think, um you know, the chief, is, the chief of staff has made it very clear that as we modernize, we're going to modernize the entire Army. It's not just a compo of one thing. Um, but because of budget constraints, because of the way we're modernizing, not everybody is going to get modernized at the same pace. And we are going to have uh, two different modernized armies. And I think it's critical. Uh, and as we look at it from a trade-off perspective, I know the Centers of Excellence, I know General Donahue in the audience, from a sustainment perspective alone, I mean, there's two different things. We can't stop sustaining the Bradley. We can't stop uh, with some of our enduring systems and not be able to have the POI, the training, and the mechanics and things like that uh, uh, just because some of our formations may be receiving uh, the XM30 or may be receiving an upgraded uh, capability. So there is a dilemma, and that is causing tension within the TRADOC enterprise because we haven't reached those traditional tipping points, whether that's 33%, 50% where you can stop the, the legacy uh, and, and focus completely on the modernized system. So that is something that we have to do. It affects COMPO 2 and COMPO 3, uh, but it's going to affect COMPO 1 as well. One of the things that we're trying to make sure, you know, before we used to, to do horizontal modernization, so everybody of the same type of thing would get something like that, but we have to look at it from vertically about how we fight. And that includes all the enabling capabilities that may not be a COMPO 1 solution. So uh, it's going to be difficult. I mean, we're looking at that. We're, we have a plan in place to make sure um, that we don't uh, divest of legacy capabilities uh, prior to the need uh, so that, that we don't shortchange any of the, any of the COMPOs. Okay, that kind of leads into the next, there's a couple of questions I'm going to try to tie together. Um, you talked about that tipping point when you, uh, as you're training at the centers of excellence, um, the enduring systems, and then when you start doing modernization. I know we went through that with the FAD system, for instance, what they would have to train at home station, when were we going to start to train it uh, in the institutions. And I think we're going to see several examples of that as we transform and these signature systems enter the force. Are our centers of excellence resourced to be able to do training on both the signature systems, the new modernization, and the enduring systems. And just as importantly, um, as we look at synchronizing dot mil PF, we've traditionally underinvested in our TRADOC centers of excellence and in the institution. Um, and what steps do we need to take to ensure that the investment is made to enable this synchronization that we're talking about? I'll, I'll start and I'll uh, tie in something that uh, Susan said earlier is, you know, so a lot of these capabilities, especially some of the exquisite capabilities that we're bringing on when we think about hypersonics and mid-range capabilities, our sister services are struggling with some of those same things. So how do we leverage their uh, capabilities as well as are the Army's capabilities? You know, so for some of the, some of the things that the Fire Center of Excellence is doing as we look at mid-range capability is going to Navy schools in order to learn about the capability and, and TRADOC trains a lot of our sister services on, uh, on compatible equipment. So I think that is something that we have to leverage as, as we go forward. Uh, from, a, from a material piece of it, I think this is where the key is about training devices and systems devices that have to be developed simultaneously along uh, with the capability. There is not, uh, there's not very many times that the, the captain in charge of the long range hypersonic battery is gonna get the fire off a live round uh, you know, in training. So what is his or her capability to do that from a training device? Where are the training devices for the mechanics to be able to work on that so that we can pull all that together? I think that's an incredibly important going forward. Uh, and, and the schools are doing what, what they can to do that, sure. So I think sometimes we'll have to induce it into the schoolhouse when we know we're going to have it in an insufficient quantity. And then I think there's other times where we'll leverage capabilities from our sister services. But I think that's an important point as we go forward. Anybody else? Okay. Um, on that topic, though, as we do transform, you know, we've talked about for a total army, you have talked about how we can leverage um, the, our sister services, how, what mechanisms do we have in place as we're modernizing 
to plug into the, our sister services to the joint and to our allies and partners to ensure that as we're synchronizing .mil PF, we're creating interoperability opportunities as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with Next Generation Constructive. And so uh, for that system, we're actually leveraging the joint staff uh, to develop it. We believe that Next Generation Constructive will be the first uh, truly joint um, constructive training environment that we're moving forward with. And we just started um, about 18 months ago, uh, two ITSICs ago, uh, if you will, in Orlando, Florida, uh, and held a working group where every service was represented in the room. Uh, the joint staff led it uh, and was able to bring all of, those, uh, all, all of those key players and to also understand the different requirements that each of the services wanted within that constructive environment. Uh, because as everybody knows, every service is, is kind of, in a way, working on their own uh, training aids, devices, systems, uh, and to get a little bit after what Susan was talking about is we're trying to find where are those places that we can find out what the other services are doing. And so we started leveraging the joint staff. That's where we're, we really started plugging in and using uh, really our simulations community, uh, our 57, uh, Alpha 57 community, uh, to get after that. And so we're going to go another round. Uh, we're developing what we believe uh, now is considered low overhead. What's going to be that minimal viable product uh, as we move forward uh, with that? But we, uh, we have involvement from each of the services uh, at this time and also to get their authoritative data in. It's not just whether or not they're going to use it, but we also got to collaborate of how do we get that data from each of those services, although we, we may be, hey, we're just the Army. But when we go to the Pacific and we fight in the Pacific, we're definitely going to have to have some of that data. Um, and uh, Air Force, Navy, uh, Marines, we're, and incorporate all of that. And so that's a little bit of a plug of what we're doing with Next Gen Constructive and how we've been moving forward is through the joint staff. Great. Ms. Hawkins. Yeah, so all really good points. Um, so one of, one of the ways you can leverage your social services is first to find out what they're doing. And, and frankly, your industry partners can really help with that. Uh, and like I said, we've really seen a sea change. Uh, before it was like we want to see your army people and this is our you know what are your army programs but um, ask us you know how are how are you helping solve this problem for other services because I have to tell you over the years you know the two and a half decades I've been doing this it's been a it was you know an issue where it's like okay we're resolving you know a similar problem again using a different funding line and, and it would be great not to do that and now we're not so from the material side I you know I talked about our product line development, but also some of the ways industry is organized can help with that. And for example, within, within our mission systems, we have an emerging capabilities branch. And that, that is basically our you know, research and development house. And that is, that is uh, division agnostic, basically, within, our, within mission systems. So it's there to kind of find the core tech base that transcends you know, the different use case mission sets that then we can mature you know, through our, um, through our different programs. So I would say, you know, reach out to your industry partners, ask to get in the right room, you know, find out what they're doing in the rdt &E area, where their IRAD sits, um, and just look a little bit more broadly. And I, I can't, um, I can't overemphasize, Jason, the comment that you made regarding getting the data out there, because if we, the, the synchronization for modernization, the, the emphasis I was making earlier about, you know, get the products out there and scale it outside the experimentation level, which I know we're doing really well, but we got to scale it beyond experimentation and field it because the interoperability requires that, that extension of the data sets. We got to get the data across services. That's where the connection between the systems, you know, any sensor, any shooter process would really happen from. And so you, you know, you got to start fielding this and putting it in the soldiers' hands and then sharing that data and that will just illuminate the areas that are needed for the future modernization. If I could pull the, pull the opposite thread of that a little bit, sure. So the multinational aspect of it, right? So, um, I mean, there is a lot that we need to do and a lot we can learn from our partners and I see a lot of them in the audience uh, today. Um, so we do a very good job of making sure 
uh, that we communicate with where we're heading as an army with our partners. But things like the C2 fix, how do we make sure that we're sharing our communications capabilities? How do we make sure we share data with our, with our multinational partners? We have an, uh, incorporating units into our training, our warfighter exercises. We have you know, different uh, nations contributed a division to fight in our warfighters together. So it's very important that as we do this transformation in contact, that we do this deliberate transformation, that we include uh, our multinational partners uh, as we go forward with them. OK, this next question really uh, comes at the opening question that I posed to you, but from a different angle. So at the risk of maybe having some repetition, I want to ask it because I like the different angle. Uh, and this question says, as we focus on transformation and contact, that in and of itself could generate desynchronization. So what is it that we need to do to bring these solutions and to avoid being desynchronized, specifically while we're transforming in contact? So I'll, I'll start, and I think, um Part of it is um, not, and I don't have the right words, but so how do we how do we take a transformation and contact unit and kind of put it in a bubble, so to speak, so that um, we can understand what it's doing? Because there's going to be things that we're going to see, uh, or we're going to put in practice that we're going to say that's just not ready, we're, that didn't work, uh, the technology is not quite there. Um, and that it only affects that individual unit per se, or perhaps you know some of its adjacent units. But when I when Tradoc thinks of things and looks at things, I mean we have to look at it from a scale perspective. So how do we how do we then make sure that we don't go down the wrong road at scale across the army from something that came in in transition and contact, but make sure that we kind of keep it centralized in those units that are doing the contact. Uh, and then take the good. Uh, we do the same thing with concepts. We say, you know, not every concept turns into doctrine. We take the validated principles out of a concept and then apply that at scale. Same thing's going to have to happen with the transformation and contact. We're going to have to take things that are validated uh, and then look at how we scale and replicate that across the rest of uh, the Army uh, and then send the, send the things that fail back to the drawing board and, and continue to work. And Anybody else? So, so from a CAC T perspective, a CAC perspective is uh, one thing I think that we've got to do is, is in contact is when we do experimentation, we've definitely got a, a lot of people, a lot of systems collecting and analyzing data. But when we go forward and we're in contact and we're in the fight, uh, you lose a lot of that, whether it's an observer, controller, trainer, whether it's a vendor, uh, whether it's an instrumentated system, uh, you lose that. And uh, I only figured this out on my own here in the last couple couple years and I wish I would have figured it out sooner is when you're at the tip of the spear uh, with that the center of army lessons learned right having a lessons learned system um, uh, and using uh, using organizations like the security assistance group Ukraine which we're seeing uh, forward in Europe uh, which call is partnered with to get those lessons learned where else are we going to get lessons right now on HMI the human machine integration and robotics uh, in AI because we're such uh, at the tip of the spear on it. I think also as we move forward in development uh, of training age devices um, and other material, we've got to look at an embedded data uh, capability as well. Uh, we're also looking at how you can do that in training where I can turn a switch on and I'm in a training environment, uh, which I think is a wicked problem, right? We talked about giving wicked problems and in, in talking to industry uh, as Susan talked about that. I think the embedded in, uh, training environment is a wicked problem. Uh, to try to solve, depending on which systems that we're looking at. And then how do we get that authoritative data across that live virtual constructive uh, totality of a, uh, of a training environments? And so uh, really I think it's, it's we got to look at our lessons learned and our data. How do we, how do we suck all that out uh, while we're in contact? Because I, th I don't think it necessarily exists today except for Center of Army Lessons Learned. And, and, and Ms. Hawkins, this is the, on the materiel side and from industry, as a follow-on to that question about being desynced, um, synchronization's a path. Are there changes to the acquisition system that are warranted that will help industry deliver modernization? And are there unintended risks of going too fast? In other words, what are the challenges to transforming in contact from your perspective? So, you know, we've seen some really good progress in acquisition approach. And I mentioned the OTAs and material acquisitions as well. I think one of the things that we need to look at, you know, that industry sees is that 
Um, sometimes the mindset doesn't change, even though the acquisition structure does. And you know, I'll just give an example right now. You know, I, you know, I, we're in an OTA. Doesn't matter which one. Um, but the customer is treating it, you know, there's no conversation because we're in an OTA, we're not supposed to talk. It's like, wait a minute, actually, we're in an OTA and we're supposed to talk. <laughs> That's the whole construct of it, but the mindset of the old acquisition approach continues to exist. So I think that, um, you know, tremendous amount of work has been done on creating paths for uh, the services to more rapidly acquire. But um, embracing the powers that you've been given is something that we haven't seen, you know, universally happen across um, all the different, you know, parts of the Army right now. So, so I'd say look internally on that one first and see if you're utilizing all the power that, that you have. As far as moving too fast, you know, there, there is an issue is that not every solution is a scalable or should be a scalable solution. And, and there may be very good reasons to have a point solution. You know, I mean, we know there are. Um, and so, and you know, for example, in working with SOCOM, you know, they, they work on a different ops tempo, we know that. Um, a lot of stuff, the Army and other services will, will see through that development and pull on to their you know, platforms, those mission solutions. Um, but many, many they don't, because you don't have the same mission, you don't have the same need. So there are areas where point solutions are very purposeful and relevant and should stay point solutions, right? They're, those aren't failures. Those are accurate, excellent processes. Yeah. No, I agree 100 percent. And I, but I think then also too to the desynchronization aspect of it is that I think we have to look individually at each one of those because sometimes we'll say, well, this is still just a prototype. Um, so it's, it's a prototype, so therefore it hasn't hit certain milestones, it hasn't hit certain gates. Uh, so we don't need to develop the training devices, we don't need to think about the sustainment aspects of it, we don't have to worry about the facilities, it's just a prototype. Well, we have a particular system already that's still in the prototype phase, but we have four battalions of it fielded uh, to our army. Uh, and because we haven't hit the trigger, we haven't fully synchronized .milpf. So those are the things that can happen. Um, so, you know, if we, if a prototype is successful and we know we're going down that road and we know we haven't hit that gate yet, it's okay. Let's, let's make the decision that says we know we're going to have this, the gate will come, but we need to get together. We need to get the training done. We need to get the facilities right. We need to go forward with the doctrine. So that, that desynchronization is out there. That's part of the reason why we're creating different ideas on how to do uh, initial training strategies, initial BOIPs, initial POIs, programs of instruction so that we can lean forward uh, so that as a prototype matures and looks like it's transitioning to a program of record, we're already set across that MLPO. And I would just yeah, add in that. transformation and contact, we're talking about prototype organizations in addition to prototype systems. And what you just said will be exponentially more important as we feel a prototype organization, and they really start learning lessons, learn beyond just one system. Yes, sir. And we'll have to go back and look at that design. Yes, sir. Exactly. Jason. And to that, absolutely want to go faster, right? Absolutely want to get these capabilities in soldiers' hands. On the opposite end of that, I also reflect on what's, what's the, what was just asked the risk, right? Or, and are, are, we, are we creating risk uh, in, in this? And are we, my concern is, are we failing fast enough? We know that we're going to make decisions and we know that it's a good practice. If you want to create a movement, you're going to burn some boats, right? You are going to go, I, I need to divest of this legacy capability. We know there's some fiscal agility that also goes along with that as well so that we can bring on uh, a new modernization effort. My worry is through MVPs is does that MVP, is it short of the capability I, I had? Do, do we come up, is it not there yet and I create and I elongate a training gap uh, to the soldiers while we continue to come out iteratively. General Kaufman talked about it a little bit yesterday. I think he said, do the goalposts keep moving? Um, do the requirements keep shifting just a little bit? Um, and so are we failing fast enough? Um, and then are we getting to that iterative process to, if we did burn the boat on a system, on a training system, it goes back to the compo two and three point. Um, do it, are we failing fast enough to still close that gap and not induce one and pass risk on to our units and our soldiers. 
Great, thanks. Um, the next, Jason, I'm going to start with you. And again, it's a, both, both of these are training-related questions, but they could uh, be expanded to .mil PF. And I'm going to combine two of them. Um, given the velocity of change that modernization brings, how, much, how must training evolve to keep pace? And then the follow-on question is, given the tremendous increases we've seen in gaming capabilities, are we leveraging the commercial uh, capabilities that are out there to better enable individual and collective training. So let me start. Let me start with that. With that second, with the commercial capabilities. I, I saw. A, I saw a note a couple of years ago. It, it's a where uh, in the uh, just in the AR VR uh, uh, realm uh, where industry was putting in about eighteen billion dollars uh, a year, and the Department of Defense had allocated for the same kind of capability about one point eight uh, billion. I, I think that's tough, right? I think that's tough when you look at it. I also, when we, when we leverage those capabilities, you're talking about the differences between a for-profit uh, industry, right? Uh, when you talk about some of that gaming industry and it's historic, where it's been historically, right? And where we're trying to create that training uh, capability uh, and we're not necessarily for-profit. Um, and so I do see, see those challenges there, but I think we're moving in the right direction. What we know is, is the closer you get to live, the closer you get to immersive training, you actually create better recall, better remembrance, better adaptability uh, for our soldiers. And so while we may have some of these challenges and there may be fiscal and other and systems and processes, that's not necessarily so much the worry as are we getting that training capability? Is it immersive? And am I raising the bar um, for um, kind of that proficiency, and can I maintain it longer even throughout the moves, PCSs, schools, uh, changing units, changing environments. You go from Europe one, one, one organization, I may be in a, in a PACOM, uh, the next organization. So I think we're moving in the right direction 100% uh, in that. And go back, to the, go back to the first one about how much training, if you could real quick on that question, the first part. Yeah, well training's evolved is evolving, yep. given that modernization is going so fast, yes. how does training need to evolve to keep pace? Wow, that, that is, I think that goes back to a little bit of what, what, I, uh, what I talked about earlier is we, in evolving fast enough, is you just saw it with project convergence, right? And there'll be a little bit of these units that do have it, right? They're gonna have a capability. Uh, we have priority divisions, right? That'll have training, but then you're going to have um, units that won't have uh, those capabilities. And so I think we have to be really good in how broad um, we look at that institutional training as our foundation and that leader development and education uh, to keep pace, but also to keep it broad enough uh, so that you can have that localized unit training when, those, when a service member or soldier shows up um, so that, so that uh, you can be flexible and adaptable as well that way, uh, rather than getting it into um, staying locked in, you just continually keep that, keep that updated. And Army U is a great place to do that uh, and to keep track of that. Calls there, we're there with CAC, um, Army U's across the street, and then that just would continue to proliferate throughout uh, all of our COEs and all of our organizations. Two, th two things just to add on about, um, you know, the, how, how modern training has to be in the future of it for consideration. And, and one is, is that, you know, some of the, some of the solutions are going to be so expensive and exquisite, you, you can't get them out there to everybody. And virtual training um, may be the only way to really do that. But another thing really for consideration is you know, training's a huge signature. You know, the adversary sees what we do when we train. Um, and a virtual training environment is an opportunity for us to explore, um, you know, con ops and techniques that frankly using the latest mission systems that we have uh, and those capabilities, we don't want to share what those capabilities are. And the way that we can do that is through a virtual training environment and get the ability to really test those out in a way that doesn't disclose um, to the adversary what our current capabilities are. I know that was a training question, but can, yeah, I, pull, no, no, can I pull in a couple other letters? Real yeah, quick? pull so, on them all. <laughs> yeah, uh, just two, sure. So, um, so when you think about training, right? Then that parallel to that has to be leader development. Then how do we take that and uh, put that into our schoolhouses? How do we make sure that our leaders are being 
taking full advantage of training capabilities too. But the last thing we want is you know people to come back to leader development on the uh, on their cycle, and it's a step backwards in technology. It's a step backwards from the way they've been training or what they've seen in the field. So we have to make sure that those capabilities, as we look toward the future, migrate into our classrooms. Uh, so that we are providing that same experience uh, for them uh, when they go to PME and, and leader development. And then the other aspect of it, and something that keeps me up a little bit at night, is there's a lot of things that I'm talking about, and a lot of capabilities, embedded training, and things like that. Well, where is that all going to occur? Well, it's going to occur in our motor pools and our facilities. So now, last time, there's not a lot of network uh, that's being plugged into uh, our facilities. So how do we make sure that our facilities are also adapting and getting ready for this capability and they can withstand uh, the, that and provide that environment too? So again, that synchronization piece that has to occur. So we need to look now at our future facilities to make sure that we can support uh, all those things that we were just talking about. Okay, so this next question really is a part of deliberate transformation. It says, with the release of the new Army structure, right, looking out for the POM force, um, are there any dot mil PF gaps that we've already identified, and what can industry do to help close those gaps? I can start with that one. Yeah, go ahead. One of Please my do. favorite topics. So that, yeah, uh, whoever asked the question, very true. On the 27th of February, the new Army structure memorandum was released, and it did significantly change uh, our Army structure. Uh, most of that was getting us towards where we had thought we were going to go for Army 2030, setting those conditions for 2040, but there were some things um, that uh, we were not able to close those gaps because of some of the budget constraints and some of the end strength issues. Uh, one of those in particular uh, is reconnaissance capabilities. So we are, we are going to be forced to uh, stand down some of our reconnaissance capability at Echelon, so something that uh, technology and the material side can help us up very much so would be how do we how do we take that and can the mission of reconnaissance and security is not going away that requirement exists no matter who we're fighting and when or where and when we're fighting so how do we then use technology in order to fill that gap would be uh, uh, an example that pops to mind immediately and and there's a follow-on question that actually goes after that is you know what persistent ISR capabilities are needed, and how can industry help with that? Um, I'm going to go to Ms. Hawkins, Jason, and then to you. So was the question which ones exist, or? Uh, what ISR capabilities are needed uh -huh. to help fill these gaps, um, and given the challenges that Dr. Risha has talked about with recon uh, in our force structures, this becomes even more critical question. Yeah, and so, well, we, we, we already saw a shift of that, right, with, with the Middle East, right? We saw that we were taking a lot of capability into ISR technology versus having people on the ground and having that. Um, so I'm not, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in the ISR uh, side of the house. I am happy if whoever asked that question is interested in, in, a, in an answer, I will go back and and then talk with them about that afterwards. But I, I'm very interested in, in hearing what you, you guys have to say regarding where you see those gaps. So uh, I'll give you an example of one, one and it's, a, it's just an example of the many things that were, as soon as that came out, we immediately went and looked at, at the force structure. What is going to be the new force structure? And then we, um, through CAC-T, we're actually also responsible for the quantities of our training aids devices and where they're at coupled with where are we going in the future with the quantities of the modernization efforts. Uh, and one of the hosts was we noticed that the military police brigades were being adjusted. Uh, and they have, a wep they have some weapon systems in use of force uh, for our new uh, uh, soldier virtual trainer. And we're like, hey, if they're being reduced, is the organization being reduced such that, or being moved to an installation such that, does it change how much we're going to develop? And does it need, to, furthermore, does it still need to be a part of the enduring requirements process to develop the soldier virtual trainer? Or is this now something that should be smaller, that we should just go to the program or the PM for and get a contract because it's localized now based on where those formations are at? And so that's the analysis we're going through right now in training aids and devices uh, to look at uh, what our struck impact has impacted uh, with, with our non-system TADs. <clears throat> And I think one more area, too, that uh, would be beneficial is uh, so we've our engineering community uh, is also um, going to consolidate capability at the at the division level now. So how can technology, how can, you know, we talked a lot about robotic capability yesterday. 
uh, but we will focus on, on the, the brigade combat teams. How do we take that next step, increment three or four, I believe is what they were talking about yesterday, and take that into some of the other proponents? How do we use robotic capability to offset some of the structural decisions that affected our engineer community? I think that's another area. Uh, so the reconnaissance and engineering communities, the military police, I think those kinds of things is where technology can help offset those uh, personnel losses. Okay, great. Um, thanks. This is a this is a great one. How many times do you see a movie with advanced technology, or robot and computer capabilities, and ask ourselves, hmm, I wonder if a defense contractor can already provide that capability to our army? Okay, Susan so, first, then Jay. So, uh, who of you grew up watching Star Trek? I know. Yeah, there you go. Lots of. I mean, we 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 have seen so much of that tech, right? You know, from Star Trek. You know, uh, today it's it's awesome. I think. Um, some of it is very inspirational for us, right? Because the, the futurists are in those movies, right? And they and they they talk about where they see potential technology going. Um, so it, you know, does art mimic life? Is life mimicking art? Kind of thing is is something. But yeah, a, a lot of it's grounded in in some of the research and development that's being done today. I mean, some of it's very futuristic, obviously, but. Um, it's impressive what I see coming out of the research and development community, right, both with the government and an in industry. So, so what I enjoy about that, it, in addition to reading some sci-fi, uh, in addition to doctrine, to try to try to mix it up a little bit, is I'm always interested, um, specifically being in a virtual environment, they always show displays. There's always some sort of battle board, common operational picture, or there's, a, th there's an update. Um, and what I thought interesting is General uh, Rainey said yesterday, hey, we're, we're going to invest a little bit in wargaming, right? We can, take the, can we take that even further with what we're seeing in movies? And can we have that with our mobile command posts on the move where I can have either a rehearsal, a meeting, a war game, and I can drop a headset down that also is cross-domain compliant at the right classification levels. And I can quickly go through that and be in a complete different room. Um, and have that update distributedly uh, across a, a multiple uh, multiple nodes, and that's what I always I'm always interested in watching the movies, and I always interested in what how they're talking, or you'll see a hologram come in of an individual um, where they're where, where they're having a meeting. Uh, that is definitely something I'm interested in uh, in moving forward with and looking at, and especially now that uh, General Rainey had talked about, hey, we're gonna we're gonna improve some of our war gaming. Uh, let's you know maybe we get rid of the arts and crafts and the yarn and going out to in the middle of the Geronimo DZ at JRTC uh, and developing and consolidating uh, these rehearsals uh, and, and um, wargaming uh, through COA development in our military decision-making processes. And how about we do that in a virtual uh, environment? And, and those, are, those are some of the things that I'm definitely interested in um, in our portfolio. Anybody else? Sir, General Beagle doesn't let me watch movies anymore, so <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything. I, w I just want to add in one thing. Please. I think out of all the latest um, sci-fi movies uh, that, that I've seen, I think the Dune one that's recently come out, just does reiterate one thing. No matter how fancy the tech is, it still comes down to a ground war. It does. <laughs> it's just the sci it and, and we heard that loud and clear yesterday, right, from General <laughs> Rainey. Um, Okay, uh, this is a point question, so probably J Jason, uh, maybe to you, and then that, that probably not much more than that. But because they asked it, I want to give them an answer. This one talks about virtual shooting realism, and it says, what are the current plans within budget to assist training for shooting accuracy and kickback royal, uh, recoil effects for smaller organizations like recruiting ROTC? And I would say probably for our uh, reserve components, but anything on that? Uh, absolutely. So just finished up uh, our latest soldier touch point um, where we're looking at the weapon systems, um, the M1718, M4, uh, some of our crew served weapons. We're looking at the recoil. I think it's very interesting uh, in the recoil technology. I'll just, uh, uh, a little antidote is we're using, uh, it, it's modern, modern technology, uh, but it's really electric and magnets uh, that are actually given that recoil. It's pretty cool. Um, and how we're getting the recoil. And no longer is there a need for an air canister. We have found the technology in the real estate of a real weapon to develop a drop-in kit to get to the realism. Uh, remember the days when we used to remove the bolt 
uh, out of the M16 and we'd put a 22 bolt in so that you could shoot indoor in the ranges. Well, now we're doing that in a synthetic environment inside the same real estate uh, that we have and no longer do we need the air canister uh, that we have. Where some of the challenges exist is it's still the integration of the, we of the weapon system with a screen, with a screen um, or uh, paint on the wall or that interaction that you'll have uh, whether you're on a range or with friend or foe that we're, we're still getting through and whether or not you still have to have a tether or if that's some sort of Bluetooth or radio frequency uh, to what we call a compute kit. Uh, but we are definitely moving in the right direction. That's kind of where we're going uh, with that. But what I'm amazed by is, is how technology is advanced and some of it's just, it's still simple electrical, magnetic, but at the same time, we've been able to reduce that technology, get it smaller and get it inside a weapons kit so I can still use my live system, still go to the arms room, still draw my weapon, still go through all the same troop leading procedures, PCCs and PCIs, but now I can just go to the range and do a drop-in kit and I can do it in a virtual environment as if I'm at a live range. And so I'm really excited about where some of that's going uh, on the last uh, soldier touch point. Hope that answers the question. Okay, um, yesterday uh, General Rainey talked a lot about uh, some of the observations coming out of Ukraine and made the comment that some might be anomalies and we need to be able to understand those and some might be true lessons that we need to think about how we're going to uh, integrate those into our force. Are there any specific lessons either that have been observed or learned that we're already drawing on and that will help us as we develop future capabilities across .mil PF? I think uh, I'll, I'll start. With the, um, I think the obvious one is counter UAS capability, right? So I think that is something that, um, regardless of the terrain, regardless of the stagnation of of the front, uh, counter UAS capability is something that we have to do. The, our, our adversaries can see us, uh, reach out and touch to us anywhere. Um, so how do we how do we deny that uh, from a sensor capability? So how do we do? How did we deny their eyes? Uh, but then also at the very simple level, how do we now teach our soldiers something that we haven't had to worry about for 20 years or so is to look back up in the sky. Um, and we've always had complete supremacy in the sky before and now we don't. So how do we do that? And uh, just this week, as a matter of fact, um, you know, down at the fire center, there's a symposium going on to get after that exact kind of question is how do we take uh, the real things that we're seeing in the Ukraine conflict and apply that to our army? And then how do we scale that across all our formations to make sure it's not just a uh, 14 series air defense problem. It's an army problem uh, to get after counter U.S. capability. So that's one one thing for sure uh, that the army's already taken on. We're already moving out on that uh, to help fix that uh, from a not only material side of the house, but from a training and uh, doctrine side of the house. Okay. Anybody else? Um, you talked about in your remarks, uh, Paul, concepts and how some not all concepts become doctrine, but some do. Um, General Rainey talked about that third time horizon with concept-based transformation. Can you just take us through a little bit how concepts become doctrine? Give us some examples of that, for instance, with MDO. And then I'd be curious to see how, uh, for the other two panelists, as concepts are developed and come out of the Future Center, how will you use those to anticipate future needs, whether it's training needs or technology that you might want to develop um, in industry? No, yes, sir. I think, um, and, and it goes back to, and, and both General Berto and General Rainey talked about this, is this relationship between TRADOC and, uh, and Army Futures Command that has to be uh, start at the four-star level and has to work its way all the way down. So I think that is that is the key as we look at um, the transformation of concepts and the doctrine, uh, uh, the conceptual way we're going to fight in the future, how we done change the force designs of our Army uh, from a material requirements perspective as the technology matures, how that becomes embedded uh, in our formation. So I think all along the way, we have to make sure that we stay synchronized. And there are efforts that... Uh, the Futures and Concept Center, General Hodney is moving on and we are all part of that. He, we sit in the same meetings, he participates in our meetings. We have to know where we want to be uh, if we want to backwards walk uh, to where we're at uh, today. Uh, so uh, to the question about what has transformed, uh, you know, 
the concept on multi-domain battle it started as and then went to multi-domain operations uh, is now all captured in FM30, which is why I brought that up. So you, we looked at the, the concept that was developed, that was experimented on, uh, it was wargamed against. Uh, this idea of convergence um, that has fallen out of that concept is now captured in our doctrine. Uh, and that is uh, how we're going to fight towards the future, whether we're in the European theater or in the Pacific theater. So uh, it's, it's that translation of when things are uh, validated, experiment on, it says, yes, this is going to work, it's adaptable for the entire army, and then we can do that uh, into our doctrine. Or if we're looking at an organizational design of the future, some of the things that we have done for Army 2030 from an organizational perspective came from the concepts uh, that Futures and Concepts did, whether that's a fires command uh, to assist with non-lethal and lethal fires uh, that, that came from purely from concept into what we were doing. This idea of information advantage, uh, conceptual a couple years ago, now we're having information advantage detachments being fielded to our force. So uh, the, the transition phase is, uh, is where the, the supported supporting relationship between Army Futures Command and TRADOC switches over and allows us to, to develop those solutions. Anybody else? So for us, where we're at, we're, we're right in the middle of what Dr. Reese was just talking about. We're in that uh, a little bit of a transition with our legacy to our present um, systems that we're looking at. And what I'm interested in definitely is what is the next set of that concept driven? Because we've applied some of the factors, knowing what the staffing process was for MDO, knowing how uh, conceptually how our formations were going to fight with it within MDO. And so that's why we're looking at, hey, CCTT and AVCAT, right? Legacy systems, great systems, but it's time for the next generational uh, event, but then what's after that? And I think where we're going is, and we're already anticipating it, and we mentioned it already, is this, this, this embedded training uh, concept. And what we're really looking at, and it's not something that you walk up to a vehicle and you, you plug it in. We're really looking at what uh, sometimes we call onboard. It's developed as a system TADS, uh, not as a, a non-system TADS. It actually comes with, uh, if we're talking materiel, it will come with that system and then what we do is we plug in, just like O drives, you know, it will drive, then how do we got to adjust training um, uh, policy uh, lessons, uh, leader development education uh, around that new system with its training that's already on board uh, with, with conceptually flipping a switch and I'm, I'm now in training mode. Yeah, so that, that, was, a, that was an interesting question. So where where we're interfacing on that is the mission modeling, right? So the con ops is being developed, working the mission modeling. Industry is very involved in that. I know we're extremely involved in that. And mission modeling actually has multiple levels. So you can start with force structure and support, and we're, we're involved with that. And then the campaigns and what's really needed to, to have a successful mission and the campaign around that. And it can go all the way down to a specific trade-off of a solution through a kill chain thread, right? And we do that, and so the, and that really ties into the, the, the models and the digitization that we have, even on the development side. It can pull through the whole pulling from concepts into con ops down into, into the trades that are made for solutions and technologies. So we'll get these last two questions, and then I'm gonna give you a chance to do closing comments. Um, I started off with, it all begins with the strategy, what do you want the Army to do? Um, this question recognizes that the current national security strategy, national defense strategy, reinforces the priority to uh, our pacing threat, uh, and therefore focuses uh, as a main effort at Indo-PACOM. Are there specific modernization requirements in training, or across .mil PF, that would bring us to uh, del deliver capabilities for the joint force. And then I would ask, and how do we balance that with the other priorities that you heard about yesterday? Because Europe hasn't gone away, and every time we focus on Indo-PACOM in Europe, the Mideast reminds us that it's still here. So comments on that, please. Start. Go ahead, Jason. Any specific training, unique training uh, challenges associated with that? No, nothing, nothing. Nothing too specific in balancing um, the priorities. I, I think we're just really in, it's, it's great that where we're at in the transition. My worry is, is, is in continuous transformation, I mentioned it. Uh, as I sit here now, I've, I've got the legacies, my day job, I've got the modernization, and now I've got this new, 
I've got this all this new information coming in and, and it was really part of the closing comments I was going to get after but it's do we have the right training aid systems and simulators right now based on all the continuous transformation based on the horizon and how we're going to balance that uh, and move forward and, and in that part of that pivotal uh, once in a generation right transition uh, I think there's some tough decisions uh, that we have to make, and we've got to be honest with ourselves as well as do we have, and that's what I'm going through right now asking my team, do we have the right systems based on this new information? We have a new PBE reform that's out, right? We have a new R-Struct that's out. We have the new Army Directive for Software Acquisition that's out. Um, and you start looking at all what I'll call executive level uh, information and orders, and we try to balance all those requirements. As we look at it right today, are there things that we need to go ahead and go, I, we absolutely just need to stop. And I, I now need to pivot and move forward. And so those are some of the challenges. Uh, I call it getting the right tads on the bus, kind of goes after getting the right people on the bus from Jim Collins, good, uh, good to great. But that was part of where I was going to go. And one of, I think one of the greatest challenges we're going to have in moving forward uh, in the uh, synthetic training environment, uh, in the training environment and training development. Right. Ms. Hawkins? Yeah, so I'd like to probably expand that question a little bit more, particularly because it's had to do with the pacing threat, right? So it's more than the joint force. I think it's the international force, yeah. right? And, I mean, that's, we know that that campaign approach is, is the approach that we're taking. And, um, you know, synchronizing across that with dot mil PF really is a bigger problem because if you... Under, you know, you use FMS as the policy arm, right, of DOD to get U.S. tech in our closest allies and partners' hands so that we can fight together and communicate together. Um, we also have to look at how that dot mil PF extends to those partners as well and how we're going to share the training and share the con ops and the practices across. Um, and so, you know, taking a look I would say taking a look at where the FMS programs are for those capabilities and then kind of pulling that thread as to which of the allies and partners we need to have that further conversation with around dot mil PF and I'm sure that's happening but really kind of looking I can tell you the industry partners we're leaning forward very hard on trying to make sure that that we can export and so we have a you know kind of an export roadmap and that export roadmap is actually the roadmap for dot mil PF across the international community. Okay, we're going to have a little fun with this last one. We get about a minute or two uh, to answer it. Um, in his uh, fireside chat, uh, General Brito talked about how do we communicate with the soldiers of today and tomorrow, the young, young soldiers, young sergeants, lieutenants and captains. We've talked about Star Wars. You talked about podcasts and webinars and other ways to get information out. This question says, as we modernize, not everything's going to go, I'm, I'm going to uh, use my own words here a little bit, um, not everything's going to go well, and soldiers are going to post things, maybe even on social media. Some things are going to say, hey, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Some things are going to criticize it. How do we respond to that kind of communication from our soldiers? I, I just ask if you guys solve that, let me know so I can and coach my children. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I got your question exactly right, but it, it. no, I, I think that's exactly right, and that's you know the whole point of the I mean some of the conversation yesterday, these soldier touch points that we're going to do. I mean, yeah, you know, obviously we don't necessarily want to go on TikTok and talk about what went wrong with some of our modernization activities, um, but I do think there is the feedback that we need, and we're not uh, we're not accustomed to that. It, but we have to get better, and we have to accept that the negative criticism is just as important. Um, as positive criticism. I mean, we, General Brito talked this morning about strengthening the profession. I mean, one of the other ways you as a leader develop is sometimes from the negative uh, as well, right? And know not what to do. So the same thing is going to apply with as we, as we get a design right, you know, it, you know, as a planner, right? How many of us were planners before? You develop this perfect plan and it goes, it goes away and you're like, well, no, that's not my plan. And you get, you get frustrated with it, but that's okay. Same thing with this. We have to take the negative criticism. There's obviously the right channels to do that, um, but you have to be prepared for something that that may pop up unexpectedly, and then you, you have a battle drill to get after that, but you can't just ignore it. So, Great. so I, I would offer to that too is also starting off uh, educating our, our soldiers with, you're seeing a prototype, 
right? A lot of the stuff we're trying to build faster is in that prototype phase. It is new. It is going to have some problems. But their importance, right? Getting their buy-in and their importance is, I think, where we also got to shape that conversation. And rather than just have them show up at a soldier touch point and go, okay, have them understand the totality of the process in the development, uh, I think will also help uh, as, 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 uh, so that you can, you can kind of keep away from, hey, look at this thing, and whether it's good or whether it's bad. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things I found uh, as I went around it and talked to soldiers is I, I don't know necessarily know where we're at in the movie uh, when we're developing a capability. Um, so, you know, from the innovation side, I, I, you know, what we call crowdsourcing, right, can be invaluable, right? We can, so, pro, you know, I would just suggest providing the means for them to provide that feedback without it being, you know, open source, but perhaps a technology way to be able to get that. I know from the industry perspective, we, you know, are just hungry for end user feedback on the solutions on a regular basis. And so finding a way to get that broad view that we can then take and use actually as you know, intelligence to do better design and, and make it easier to use product or a more effective product is, is something we would welcome. Okay, thanks. Uh, this has been a very uh, uh, instructive panel, and you all have been terrific. Uh, I, I don't know if the lights are going to start flashing or Annette's going to come down, but I know we're getting ready to get closed out. If we could just, I'll give you a few seconds to make some closing comments, uh, starting with you, Ms. Hawkins, and we'll work our way here. Just very quickly, thank you to AUSA and, of course, uh, you know, the, my fellow panelists for this opportunity. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Your contributions were great. Jason? No, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, can't say it enough, once in a generational transformation change, a lot of what we have is in the 70s and 80s uh, with the technology that we deal with today. And it's very much about getting uh, the right equipment, the new equipment as fast as we can uh, while reducing risk uh, so that we can deliver combat ready forces all the way from the classroom to the synthetic training environment uh, to field training uh, to the battlefield. And so I just really appreciate today's discussion. Oh, thanks too, sir, for you and for the for the panel and for AUSA for allowing me to be up and part of this. I think um, there used to be, well, there still is a saying, is who else needs to know? So when you think about .milpf integration, what other letter is impacted? That would be my last call. What impact does it have on the organizational leader development, the training doctrine side of the house so that we can lean forward uh, with developing those solutions? So I'd like to close with thanking our panel for their uh, preparation, their thoughtful comments, um, their uh, pretty good uh, on-the-fly answers to questions, uh, and, and uh, I really appreciate the interaction between the three of you, not only in prep, but even in, you saw, you saw that in your responses. So thank you for that. Thank you to AUSA uh, for the opportunity to have this discussion of integrating .mil PF as we bring capabilities uh, to the Army. A and more importantly, I just want to close with this thought. While we're talking about .mil PF and synchronizing the delivery capabilities, this is all about improving the capabilities and saving the lives of soldiers uh, on the battlefield. And it's to them that we dedicate the opportunity to have this panel. So thank you and thank you to AUSA. Yeah. Well done, panel. We'll now take a short break before our last speaker of the day, Lieutenant General Christopher Mohan, Deputy Commanding General, Army Material Command, which will commence at 1110. Please enjoy refreshments in the exhibit halls sponsored by Shi Atika. All right, well, welcome back. I want to thank everybody. Uh, I know it's the last morning, and uh, you know, folks are uh, running around, and some people departing a little bit early. So, those of you who are here, I wish I could. You know, do like they do on TV sometimes. You can look under your seat, and somebody wins a new car or something like that for being here, but. Uh, being, yeah, maybe an iPad or something. I don't know. Being a nonprofit, we can't afford that. But it's. Uh, but thanks for joining us. I will tell you, 4,000 people were streaming uh, just uh, the last uh, the last panel, and I'm sure still still on here, which is is pretty awesome. And then we'll also we record all the sessions and and uh, put them out afterwards, and there'll be well over 5,000 folks in a, in a few months that will will watch the uh, the presentations and all the panels. So that's that's great news. But thanks for joining us those you're here. I'm really uh, proud to introduce our, our last keynote speaker who's gonna bring it home batting cleanup 
And uh, baseball season's just starting, so he's going to start off the baseball season here, hitting a home run, hit one out of the park for us. And uh, Lieutenant General uh, Christopher Mohan, and uh, you know, really appreciate him being here, the Deputy Commanding General of U.S. Army Materiel Command. In his role, he's responsible for managing the day-to-day -day operations of the Army's logistics and sustainment enterprise. No small task there. Holy smokes. Delivering precision sustainment uh, and uh, material readiness to the global force while ensuring soldiers, civilian, and family readiness. You know, AMC ensures the Army remains the best equipped and best sustained fighting force in the world. And what a magnificent job they, they do with that. Lieutenant General uh, Mohan has held several notable assignments. I'm not going to go through his entire bio. Uh, we'd be here too long. But he, said he commanded the Army Sustainment Command. He commanded the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, the 3rd Sustainment Command Expeditionary. Uh, and in his current position, uh, he also serves as a senior commander of Redstone Arsenal, overseeing base operation and Redstone strategic growth, supporting more than 70 different organizations uh, which make global contributions. So please join me in welcoming Lieutenant General Chris Mohan. Well, I guess uh, it is good to be the cleanup batter, right? <laughs> And so I'm not sure if that's uh, the, uh, the number four position or the number nine position. So we can wait until uh, after I'm done and you can, you can be the judge of that. Well, I want to say, hey, good morning and uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and General Brown, thank you for the kind introduction. And, uh, and thanks to AOSA for just another fantastic conference. And um, uh, the Global uh, Symposium, Global Force Symposium, is a, uh, uh, something that has been around for quite a bit. And I think this is the biggest one ever um, uh, with the most attendance. And we can't do it without AUSA, uh, both at the national level. But I got to give a shout out to our local AUSA chapter, uh, the, uh, the Redstone Huntsville chapter. I mean, they're just. So as I roll at senior commander, I get to, to interface with a lot of leaders and a lot of local leaders in particular. And uh, I tell people unabashedly, this is the fourth time I've been in a senior commander role, and uh, this local community is the, uh, is the gold bar standard. And so I want to say thanks to, uh, to all our folks that are out there uh, from the local community. Uh, so I hope that without a doubt, this week demonstrated that the Army sustainment community is focused on delivering ready combat formations. It's been a truly phenomenal week of discussions exploration of, and collaboration between our Army and our, and our great uh, industrial base. And I got asked by a senior leader yesterday, hey, are these things, are they really worth it? And, um, and uh, I said, absolutely, because it's not because of the point-to-point the -point interface that we have. It's because I have the opportunity, like for me on the floor this morning, I grabbed three other people, and we had a conversation with a, uh, an industry partner about a critical capability as we're all working together and all pulling on the same end of the rope. So these things are powerful. And together, I think we're working really hard to gain shared understanding uh, about some of the complex challenges that, uh, that we face um, as, we, as we go forward uh, together and confront security realities that are around the globe and security challenges that are around the globe. And let me tell you what, at AMC, um, it, I hope it is, we are clearly demonstrated, demonstrating that we are totally focused on achieving the Chief's focus area number two, delivering ready combat formations. And we're doing that through several areas. We got multiple lines of effort, um, but, uh, but just I want to highlight just a couple of them. Transforming Army installations, advancing equipment modernization and readiness, rapidly dist uh, redistributing excess equipment and divesting obsolete equipment, and in conjunction with our Army Service Component Commanders, setting and preparing our theaters around the globe. Um, and so I'm going to highlight a few of these, but let me just tell you what, we are laser focused. You know, you heard the saying, right? If he likes it, we love it. If he's interested, we're infatuated. Uh, so you're going to hear how we're infatuated on a bunch of these things as we drive on them for, for our chief. Um, so let me pull the thread on just a few of these topics. Uh, so let me start um, on the outside. Let me start with the theaters. So I recently had the opportunity to visit um, both um, uh, Europe and the Pacific, and I can say unequivocally that the sustainment community, the global enterprise, is engaged around the globe, and we are employing the might 
of the organic and the industrial, the organic industrial base and the United States industrial base to accomplish uh, what our COCOM commanders are asking us to do around the globe. Let me give you some, uh, some highlights. Ukraine support. Overall, I will tell you that the war in Ukraine was a, a national wake-up call, not only to the fact that we still have enemies who, are, who are, are trying to defeat our way of life, but also to the importance of sustainment, uh, the, the importance of, of logistics forces. And we've seen the results of not having invested in that capability, but also the results of when you invest in that capability, like our set the theater and prepare the theater operations with the 21st TSC, Team 21, kind of proud of that unit. But since the, uh, the war began, we have, we have supplied our partners with over $13 billion worth of equipment. And that's, that's hard iron, that's ammunition, that is, that is clothing, anything and everything, we have supplied that. But let's talk about the might of the organic industrial base and the industrial base. We, used, we have used over 8,000 trucks 236 trains, train loads, and over 115 vessels to move this equipment around the world. And I'm talking about not just from CONUS to, to Europe, but from, from other places, Indo-PACOM, um, uh, CENTCOM, as we have rapidly marshaled and moved equipment around the globe uh, in order to focus it in, uh, in, in preparing our partners, uh, the Ukrainians. And if you think about that, who else can do that? Nobody. Nobody else can do that because of the, the combined capability between the uniform service, our great uh, Department of Army civilians and our artisans at, in the organic industrial base, and then the might of the industrial base of the United States of America. Now, we don't do it alone. We have global partners, and some of you I see represented here today, and I will tell you, we do not do it alone. And, uh, and, and if you go to some of our facilities far forward, um, it is the Star Wars bar scene of countries. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly how we're going to fight this war. That's how we're supporting this war. And that's how we're going to fight the next war as well. But we've learned a lot of lessons. Look, uh, remote maintenance or telemaintenance, it's an absolute game changer. It is, it is, a, it is the combination of communication, uh, in some cases it, uh, additive, manu or additive manufacturing, uh, artificial intelligence to help with uh, uh, and, uh, to help with translations, uh, interpreters, um, and then our technicians, both wrench turners, and also our technical experts globally. So you can go to one of those sessions and there'll be people in the room. I've seen people wearing virtual uh, reality headsets. I've seen um, uh, video chat from CONUS and also from other places around the globe as we're trying to solve complex problems for our partners who are learning basically in combat how to operate some of our systems. And that, that technology or that process started very early um, with, uh, with our greatest weapon, which is a handful of young soldiers. A young warrant officer and four soldiers started what is now a, a new way of thinking about how we do business. And, uh, but we're not done yet. So we've reformed and changed the way we think about the front end of it. But the back end of it is where we could use some help from industry. Because at the end of the day, we still go to a warehouse, we still pull a part off, of, off a, a wire shelf, put it in a cardboard box and put it on the back of the truck and it goes off into Never Never Land. We've got to reform the back part of that and the distribution part of that, and that's where we can use your help. Um, now look, I will tell you for our industry partners, the Ukrainians absolutely love our equipment. Um, and we are gathering critical sustainment data so we can better build our models so we can prepare for our next, um, our next combat operation, our next war. Um, and, and we're learning from them, uh, but they love our equipment. And you know why they love our equipment? Um, because it's not only the combat effectiveness of it, it's because of the survivability that's baked into our systems. They do not have that from uh, the older Soviet bloc or Russian equipment. Um, ours is designed that the crew walks away. Still a very lethal battlefield. And you know why I know that? Because they've told me that. Because I've looked them in the eye and seen the systems that have taken a, a tremendous shot and, uh, and, and talked to the soldiers that walked away. So, so we got to continue doing that. Another thing we're learning is uh, how to leverage data analytics and be, so we can become more 
predictive, and precise. So for many, for several years now, AMC has been working on the AMC Predictive Analytics Suite, or APAS. And early in the conflict in Ukraine, we deployed that system and supported the SAG-U to help them better see themselves, help them better understand how, how uh, material was going to flow, how combat power was going to be built, and it is an absolute game changer. But the key is it's a decision support tool. You know, as General Rainey said yesterday, um, AI is not going to, we're still going to have a, a human in the middle of that. But, but these tools allow you to get to the X faster. Um, do some of the, the analysis to get us to the X faster so that a human, a leader, can make the necessary decision. Um, APAS, holistic picture of readiness. Um, it can give you maintenance data. It can give you uh, ammunition positioning data so we can make the right kind of transportation to systems or decisions. Hey, do we fly it or do we put it on a boat? And, and that is in use daily. And there's some other uh, uses that it's being, or other utilization uh, things that, that are being worked that uh, beyond the scope of this conversation, but it is a dynamic capability that, uh, that we are committed to continuing to develop. And for our theater sustainment commands, we are going to work to get you a, a common suite of tools uh, so that you can then plug in, because the more we can see what you're doing, the better we can support you. Um, so pivoting to Indo-Pacific, look, every, we acknowledge every theater is unique. Every theater has unique challenges, unique capabilities, but there's some commonality there. Talisman Saver 23 demonstrated our ability to, to push large portions of, of equipment and supplies around the world in a, a you know, look, everything is eight hour, everything in, in uh, the Pacific is an eight hour flight. Um, and so uh, Talisman Saver um, demonstrated our ability to move equipment around. It also demonstrated our ability not only to move uh, manned equipment around, but to, to project Army preposition stocks, both from the sea um, and also pulling from stocks in Korea, all focused to the, uh, the country of Australia, our great partners, the Australians, where we issued that equipment and where some of it still, uh, is, uh, still resides right now. And so those are, that's a, just another, um, another uh, uh, great um, a demonstration of the capabilities that we have as an Army. Um, in the Indo-Pacific, we're also looking at the future of Army watercraft. Look, there's a, a, we're all collaborating on a, a watercraft modernization strategy. Uh, as we learn and see how we're going to use watercraft in, um, uh, in future conflicts, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, Indo-Pacific, we're also pushing the limits of thought um, when we think about what the future of watercraft looks like. So imagine an autonomous watercraft that is just going from one island to another or one spot to another. Um, that future is here. In the Gulf of Mexico right now, there's, there's autonomous watercraft that are servicing oil rigs. Why can't we do that? So then think about if you can, if you can couple an autonomous watercraft with a, with a UAS capability um, that can do heavy lift and lift 2,000 pounds, 1,000 pounds, you know, an MLRS pod, a Gimler's pod, um, water ammunition, deliver it to a, a uh, the place in the middle of a small island so it can execute a fire mission and then reverse the process. If you do that, um, uh, couple those two systems, those capabilities together, then you have the ability to, uh, to sidestep one of the most complex and expensive things on Army watercraft, which is the ramp. Um, so if you don't need a ramp, uh, you can get a faster boat, you can get a cheaper boat, and uh, you can get one that's more capable. So we're pushing the limits on all that. Army preposition stocks, important to all theaters. It's got to be modernized, sized, strategically located. And when it does, and when we have all those elements, it is a true strategic deterrent that we've seen that the projection of Army preposition stocks in times of crisis, like when we, when we issued one of the heavy brigade combat sets in, uh, in, in Germany, during the initial stages of the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine was a true strategic deterrent. And so we know that we have to continue to invest in, um, in uh, APS. Look, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, um, uh, and we're doing it different to meet the needs of the combatant commanders in the requisite theaters. In Indo-Pacific, uh, we're exploring options to do more ground basing of APS uh, in, in, in smaller piles, if you will. Reduce the, the signature of the, um, of the storage locations, more dilemmas for our potential adversaries. And in Europe, 
we're transitioning our thought process from brigade level sets to what the division level um, capability looks like. And all those things are, um, one, they're very resource intensive. And, and also, um, uh, but they're also, there's a great utility in using APS during training exercises. One, it's good for us to project that APS out, to utilize it, and this is a clear demonstration when we were able to rapidly lift a heavy brigade combat team and move it to the, to the tactical assembly area. And so again, that strategic deterrence uh, area is, is absolutely critical. We acknowledge that in a resource-constrained environment, tough decisions are gonna have to be made. And, uh, and we're working very hard with the Army who manages the, uh, we manage the APS program for the Army and we're working very hard so that we make the right kind of uh, risk-informed decisions. Coming back to the homeland, the Joint Strategic Support Area. So we're focused on, look, we know that in the next conflict, the JSSA as we call it, the homeland is gonna be contested uh, via, via kinetic means, kinetic cyber, um, uh, or just disruptive cyber capability or disruptive means of other, uh, of other types. We know we're gonna be contested. And so what we need and what we're driving on is to lean our formations as much as possible. And one key thing that I will tell you that, uh, that we're working extremely hard, again, if he likes it, we love it, um, is the, uh, the, removal, the rapid removal of excess effort that we're doing. We call it R2E. Just like a lot of Americans, our units have become heavy. And heavy with 20 years of equipment and supplies that we have left over from multiple wars and multiple conflicts. We've executed four locations so far around the, uh, around center at, um, uh, centered in primarily the 18th Airborne Corps footprint. We're gonna move west as the year goes on. And the R2E, because we're taking it as is, we're just saying, hey, bring it to us. Bring it to us and we'll dispose of it. Um, that process has yielded incredible results. Um, so what do, what do you mean by incredible? Um, four sites, 65,000 pieces of excess. Fort Campbell right now, we've taken, we had a, a goal set and we've exceeded it by 100% of the goal and we're still going. Some locations we're gonna go back and do another touch because it's so valuable to get this equipment out. So what does that do when we get this excess equipment out? One, units aren't spending money on maintaining it. They're not spending time doing inventories and then it frees up space in motor pools and storage locations so that we can, the unit is in prepared to receive modernized equipment. Now, what are we gonna do with the equipment? Some of it will go back to depot, some of it will be disposed of in place, but there's also huge opportunities we see for foreign military sales and building compartment, uh, partner capacity as we, um, as we continue to work through this process. Uh, but again, it's something that, um, it ain't sexy, but it is making a difference in units. With so the chief, when he came in, he said, look, when I go out and talk to company commanders, one of the biggest things they talk to me about is the amount of property they have and the fact that they're not using it. And so we're getting after that. So let's talk about um, modernization. Make no mistake, the sustainment community is future focused. Modernization is not just about weapon systems, uh, but it's about training. It's about everything we need to generate, protect, sustain the weapon systems and the people that operate them. We, AMC, we are completely synchronized with TRADOC and Army Futures Command and the, the uh, contested logistics CFT. Simply put, because we have to be. It is to our benefit to be deep in to that process as we work to, uh, to modernize and the sustainment enterprise. Um, we have a term that we use in AMC, it's called precision sustainment. We acknowledge that uh, future conflicts, we're gonna be contested in the home place, in the home and the homeland. Um, we're gonna be um, uh, deploying at rates. You know, think about a bench clearing event. And so we have to be precise in not only what we bring, but also how we do sustainment. Moving forward, we're gonna work, we're working very hard to better link the warfighter at the tactical edge to the defense industrial you know, base or ecosystem, if you will. Um, this will enable us to make those, those right kind of decisions. It'll enable us, look, we used to say um, from, the, from the factory to the foxhole. Now we're saying from the foxhole to the factory and then back to the foxhole at speed, at the speed of war. And we gotta get better at that. Demand reduction. 
We've got to get after demand reduction. This is where we really can use industry help. Um, less fuel requirements, less battery requirements, less water, oh, spot power. Look, we should not buy a system that does not produce more power than it consumes. Additive manufacturing. Look, additive manufacturing, it can be an absolute game changer. And we are working very hard on that with, um, with our great partners um, around, the, you know, around the organic industrial base, um, particularly centered right now on TACOM and at the JMTC at Rock Island Arsenal. We, I'm proud to say, after many, many, many efforts and many, many years, to be totally honest, uh, two weeks ago we shipped, we shipped our first additively manufactured um, part to the 278 BCT. It was a, I'd say it's a relatively simple part, a Bradley, uh, a Bradley fan, fan shroud, but as soon as that unit got that part, they put it on a vehicle and brought a vehicle off the deadline report. Right now, there's at least a dozen more parts in production, and I think Michael Laylor told me that uh, just a couple of days ago, he signed off on the next, the next tranche, which is M88 parts. Is that gonna be the overall panacea? Absolutely not, but will it generate, get vehicles off the deadline so commanders can train with it, or in a combat scenario, will it generate additional combat power to meet mission requirements? Absolutely. And as we get better at this, um, as we get access to more tech data, what we're gonna see is the miniaturization of some of that capability, and we wanna push that capability as far forward as possible. All that's in the realm of the possible, and it is absolutely doable. But look, we will never replace the industrial base and the organic industrial base. So we have to update and, and modernize the organic industrial base. 23 depots, arsenal, ammunition plants, about $300 billion worth of infrastructure. We've gotten great support um, from Congress and they have authorized a 15 year, we have a 15 year, $18 billion plan to modernize our organic industrial base and it's being executed right now. So when you think about the OIB, you know, a lot of people think that it's, you know, it's Rosie the Riveter, people with hammers beating on things, um, but think about a modernized facility with robotics, um, with advanced manufacturing, very flexible building uh, manufacturing capability. There's still people with hammers beating on things uh, because that's what blue collar folks like me do, but it's, but it's really important. And, um, and think about being able to rapidly push that capability to the warfighter to integrate the OIB with the tactical edge. We're working that. I will tell you that, um, that in 23, we're, we're well on the way. 23, $2.5 billion worth of projects were executed. 24 and 25, 125 projects are planned worth $3 billion. And so we cannot do this without being informed with our industry partners because we don't need to build and modernize at the same rate and then build by the same machines. We have to understand where your gaps and seams are and we have a responsibility to fill some of those gaps and, and, and uh, seams. Sustainment modernization will absolutely not happen with our, without our industry partners. And look, moving forward, we can't rest on our laurels of all the stuff that we did in Ukraine. Because remember, as we cross that ocean um, with all those ships that I talked about, over 120 ships, we're doing that at, at will. Um, we cannot think that that's going to be uh, the way it is when we go to war with a, a, uh, a peer or near peer competitor. So that means we cannot rest on our laurels and we cannot protect the status quo. And while we need industry to help us innovate, um, we also need to go back to the basis on, basics on managing our supply chain. You know, the chief talks about excess property and class nine, and we need industry's help. We need you to give us the parts that we've ordered, do the necessary things to manufacture those parts. And if you're not gonna do that, give us the tech data um, and if you're not going to do that, don't be surprised when we reverse engineer it because it's that critical that we get the right kind of parts and to our warfighters so that our kids who are out there on those combat vehicles don't look at a broken vehicle for a fan shroud. So we need industry's help in that. Now look, there's a lot of space in between the two and we're working really hard to understand where we have gaps and seams and then speed the process that we, tra you know, we can transmit tech data because it's one thing to have it, but how do you get it from the from the, from the computer to the machine, we, we're working on that, but we gotta have your help on that. Look, I know that, uh, that we've covered a great deal of, of ground this week, but we still got a long ways to go. 
and we are absolutely committed uh, to, to shoulder to shoulder work with our industry partners. We do it all the time. Log cap, can't do it without you. Um, uh, OEMs, can't do it without you. So we've got to talk to each other. We've got to sit down a across the table and walk the floor at our facilities together so that we can do this together and continue to sustain the, the greatest army in the world. Look, we've got the best sustainers and logisticians in the world, and they are all laser focused on doing what is right for our army. And we've got to help them because that's our responsibility. Uh, so I want to say thanks to, to all of you for, uh, for your participation. I want to say thanks to AUSA again for hosting this great conference. And um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, God bless our Army. Now look, I would ask that you stay, stay seated because we are going to recognize three great sustainers um, with, a, uh, with an award that's named after a gentleman that's truly remarkable. And I think he's actually monitoring. And that's uh, Lieutenant General Retired Greg. And so, so thanks so much for your time. Uh, God bless everybody. God bless America. Be all you can be. This will defend. Ladies and gentlemen, the presentation will begin momentarily. Please silence or turn off all cell phones or electronic devices. Welcome to the ninth presentation of the Lieutenant General Arthur J. Gregg Sustainment Leadership Award. We extend a warm welcome to all our industry partners, military members, both active and retired, and friends of the community. Thank you for joining us as we present this prestigious Sustainment Leadership Award. We also want to add a special welcome to Lieutenant General Retired Arthur J. Gregg, who could not be here today, but is currently attending virtually. The Department of the Army, Deputy Chief of Staff G4, established the Lieutenant General Arthur J. Gregg Sustainment Leadership Award in 2015, and first awarded it in 2016 to recognize individuals who have made significant and measurable contributions to Army sustainment operations. These individuals are influential logistics leaders who have made unparalleled contributions to enhance operating efficiencies and improve resource management in support of Army sustainment and readiness as voted on by a board of senior military and Department of Army civilian representatives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the official party for today's ceremony. They are Lieutenant General Christopher O. Mohan, Deputy Commanding General of the United States Army Materiel Command. Lieutenant General Heidi J. Hoyle, the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army, G4. Command Sergeant Major Jimmy J. Sellers, Command Sergeant Major of Army Materiel Command, and Sergeant Major Pedro M. Caceres, the Army G4 Sergeant Major. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as we read the citation. The Lieutenant General Arthur J. Gregg Sustainment Leadership Award is awarded to Sergeant Major Maximo Nunez, the G3 Sergeant Major for 8th Theater Sustainment Command, for exemplary service, for significant and measurable contributions to Army sustainment operations, and for serving as a role model whose success can be emulated by all. Sergeant Major Nunez epitomizes what a senior logistician NCO is in today's Army. He supported over 100,000 joint warfighter executing operations across the Indo-Pacific Theater. Sergeant Major Nunez also provided oversight for the distribution of all classes of supply, mortuary affairs support, and aviation ground maintenance for more than 40 exercises as part of operations pathways. Sergeant Major Nunez could not be here today, but he will be presented the award at a later date. Mr. Jeffrey A. Martin, please join the official party on stage. The Lieutenant General Arthur J. Gregg Sustainment Leadership Award is presented to Mr. Jeffrey A. Martin, Deputy Director for the Fielded Forest Integration Directorate, 
Combined Arms Support Command for exemplary service, for significant and measurable contributions to Army sustainment operations, and for serving as a role model whose success can be emulated by all. Mr. Martin demonstrated an exceptional level of service, fulfilling a career in the Army as a warrant officer, and now provides unbiased and sound advice on logistics and strategic decisions for the Combined Arms Support Command. Mr. Martin has been pivotal in guiding requirements for key military operations. His foresight and influence in the development of future, future logistics systems are shaping the future of sustainment for the Army of 2030 and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You may take your seat. Mr. Robert Pat Sullivan, Colonel, United States Army, retired. Please join the official party on stage. The Lieutenant General Arthur J. Gregg Sustainment Leadership Award is awarded to General Ann Dunwoody, United States Army, retired, for exemplary service for significant and measurable contributions to Army sustainment operations and for serving as a role model whose success can be emulated by all. General retired Dunwoody holds the honor of paving the way for women in the Army. She was the first woman to achieve the rank of four-star general in the United States military and served as the commanding general of Army Materiel Command. She was the first woman to hold the Deputy Chief of Staff G4 position, the first commanding general of Combined Arms Support Command, and the first woman to command a battalion in the 82nd Airborne Division. Not only do these milestones highlight her personal achievements, but also her impact on increasing opportunities for women in the armed forces. Mr. Sullivan is receiving the award on behalf of General Dunwoody, who could not be here for the presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you to Lieutenant General Mohan, Lieutenant General Hoyle, Command Sergeant Major Sellers, and Sergeant Major Caceres for presenting these awards in this forum. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's presentations. Thank you for attending. This will defend. Be all you can be. Well, thanks. Uh, clearly, uh, Chris Mohan is uh, a great baseball player, batting uh, cleanup, knocked one out of the park, did a, uh, did a great job. Thanks so much. And what an honor, uh, uh, General Greg, uh, if you're watching there, we're just all so proud. Uh, had the opportunity, he did a, a podcast at uh, AUSA headquarters a few months ago, and I'm telling you, he could, he could beat me in a fitness test without any, uh, without any question tomorrow. He's an amazing, amazing leader and person we're so proud and uh, so, so great to see the recipients uh, in his honor. So thanks, thanks for watching, sir, and thanks for your incredible inspirational leadership. Well, uh, a great event, and I want to thank, of course, uh, AMC and uh, AFC and, and so many folks. Really, uh, you can't, uh, can't have a successful event like this without a lot of teamwork, and we recognized earlier the uh, AUSA award-winning AUSA Huntsville, uh, Redstone Huntsville chapter, and thanks so much for all they did. They're out there volunteering uh, every single day, early in the morning, late, uh, unbelievable. So thanks for pulling it together. I don't know about you, but I just learned a ton and feel really good about the future and where we're going uh, and the hard work being done. Uh, just uh, unbelievable, both at AMC and at Futures Command, and then also thanking TRADOC for their involvement here as well. Just uh, some great panels and discussion today. So uh, make sure uh, that uh, on your way out, the floor is still open, and uh, you know, can hit that on your way out. And we really appreciate the tremendous support. There's also a, a great ROTC luncheon where I understand 
we've got a record number of cadets, which really makes you feel good. You know, we, we hear about recruiting challenges, but I'll tell you what, when you, when you interact with these young men and women, you're going to feel really good about the future, and that's a record number uh, that we'll go to right after this. So thanks very much. Thanks for uh, hanging with us, the folks here. I uh, really appreciate it, and uh, have a great Army day. Cool. Cool. You're